family members of military contractors who were killed working in Iraq testify on Capitol Hill. This House oversight hearing on Iraq reconstruction examines the role of private contractors. Henry Waxman of California chairs this five-hour hearing. The meeting of the committee will come to order. Today, the committee will investigate potential fraud, waste, and abuse in the almost indecipherable world of contractors and subcontractors. For the last two years, I've tried to get a clear answer to what I thought was a simple question. How much money a Halliburton subsidiary named KBR and private security subcontractors were making under the Army's troop support contract called log cap. We know that the war in Iraq has given private contractors an unprecedented role in providing security services. Almost $4 billion in taxpayer funds has been paid for private security services in the reconstruction effort alone. But sorting out overhead, subcontracts, sub-subcontracts, profit and performance has been nearly impossible. For over 18 months, the Defense Department wouldn't even respond to my inquiry. When it finally replied last July, it didn't even supply the breakdown I requested. In fact, it denied that private security contractors did any work at all under the log cap contract. We now know that isn't true. And today, we will try to understand the layers of subcontractors with a particular emphasis on the Blackwater Company. On March 31, 2004, four Americans working as private security personnel for Blackwater, all of whom were military veterans, were ambushed and killed in Fallujah while on a protection mission. Their tragic death became a turning point in public opinion about the war and directly resulted in a major U.S. military offensive, which is known as the First Battle of Fallujah. 27 American soldiers, and over 800 insurgents and Iraqi civilians died in that battle, and military observers believe it helped fuel an escalation of the insurgency. It is now almost three years later, and we still don't know for sure the identity of the prime contractor under which the four Blackwater employees were working. What we do know is that Blackwater was providing security services under a contract with a Kuwaiti company called Regency, and that Regency was itself a subcontractor for ESS support services worldwide, which in turn was a subcontractor providing dining services and construction services for other contractors such as KBR and Fluor Corporation. We also know that both Blackwater and Regency were adding significant markups to the cost of providing the security services. And on top of that, the prime contractor, whomever it was, was making its own percentage off the contract. Blackwater initially indicated that it believed KBR was the prime contractor under the log, cop, log cap contract. Three months ago, however, ESS told the committee that the Floor Corporation was actually the prime contractor for Blackwater work in Fallujah. The Floor Corporation disputes this, and the Defense Department doesn't seem to be sure what's going on. It's remarkable that the world of contractors and subcontractors is so murky that we can't even get to the bottom of this, let alone calculate how many millions of dollars taxpayers lose in each step of the subcontracting process. But the impacts of contracting waste go beyond just dollars and cents. Today, four family members of the four murdered Blackwater employees will share their testimony with us. They believe Blackwater sent their relatives into Fallujah unprepared and without armored vehicles, a rear gunner for each vehicle, or heavy automatic weapons to defend against attacks. Their experience tells them that tax dollars never reached the security personnel on the ground they believe that the money for protective equipment took a back seat to the multiple layers of contractor profits. 
I don't know if we will be able to resolve that issue today, but I'm deeply troubled by one document we have found in preparing for this hearing. The day before the four soldiers were killed, a Blackwater employee sent an email alerting superiors that a lack of equipment, armored vehicles, and other safety equipment left the team unprepared to begin its mission. That warning was seemingly ignored, and we need to explore that further. And without objection, this email will be made part of the hearing record today. I've already learned that sorting out the webs of subcontracts is confusing work, but our committee has an absolute obligation to the taxpayers to make sure their tax dollars are well spent and not siphoned off into billions of dollars of unnecessary overhead. And even more important, we have an inviolate obligation to the men and women in harm's way and to their families to make certain that their safety doesn't take a backseat to corporate profits or wasteful spending. I look forward to learning more from our witnesses this morning. I want to then uh, now call on uh, the ranking member of this committee, uh, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you, Mr. Waxman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, we once again meet to examine the challenges of managing contracts in Iraq. Uh, since 2004, the Committee has been engaged in continuous and vigorous oversight of contracting activities in the war zone. That oversight involved five full committee hearings, 14 subcommittee sessions, numerous briefings from the agencies involved, and review of thousands of documents the Committee obtained from key Federal agencies. Those efforts focused on contracts for logistical support of U.S. military operations and for reconstruction efforts. Throughout this review, it has been our goal to move beyond just the charged rhetoric and easy generalities that swirl around the topic and get to the underlying realities of acquisitions in Iraq. The truth is gritty enough. No one needs to embellish or exaggerate it. Still, some prefer to oversimplify, distort, and prejudge the outcome of complex contracting processes to fit the preordained conclusion that nothing goes right in Iraq. I would rather pursue a more constructive mode of oversight that looks beyond the headlines to make a lasting difference in our policies and save taxpayers money. Some of today's testimony will focus on a brutal incident in 2004 in which four civilian security personnel retained by Blackwater USA, a security contractor, were ambushed and killed in Fallujah. Our hearts go out to the families of those four men. Committee members should keep in mind that liability Fallujah incident is the subject of pending civil litigation. And I would ask unanimous consent at this point to put in the record in a, in a, a letter from Callahan and Blaine to uh, Speaker Pelosi on this matter. Without objection, the letter will be made Thank part you. of the record. In view of the court actions, I know that the longstanding committee policy still applies. This is not the form to prosecute private lawsuits or the place to exploit the tragic events. Uh, but we should. There are some unanswered questions, Mr. Waxman, and I applaud you for trying to get to uh, uh, some closure on these issues. A separate focus of this hearing is on management and oversight of private security agreements, specifically the allegation that tiering of uh, personnel charges by layers of security subcontractors exorbitantly inflated the price paid by the government under cost plus agreements. Tiering could be pernicious if each party was free to mark up their invoices and pass them on. But so far, we found that subcontractors had fixed price contracts with the DOD prime contractor KBR, a former Halliburton subsidiary. So the subcontractors could not pass on costs beyond the fixed unit prices, mostly competitive bid, in their contracts. In those cases, at least, the alleged profiteering could, shouldn't be possible. There is no legal way to profit from tiering under that scenario. Even so, there remains the question of whether KBR may have acted improperly by allowing its subcontractors to use any type of security services at all or for not knowing whether the third and fourth tier subs included any security costs in their competitively bid fixed price contract costs. The prime contract includes a generic prohibition against employees carrying weapons without special permission. Whether this prohibition can be stretched into a specific ban or even implicit security charges by remote subcontractors operating in a war zone will likely be the subject of intense discussion between the Army and KBR. Make no mistake, there are still too many problems with contracting in Iraq. Just look again at the mess made through the Baghdad Police College, with raw sewage surging through classrooms. More recently, we heard about unauthorized VIP trailers in Olympic-sized swimming pools paid for with U.S. tax dollars. With that in mind, I look forward to exploring solutions to the constant security and logistical challenges that make contract oversight in a war zone so challenging. How do we get the right number of acquisition professionals and auditors with the right skills to the operational theater in time to prevent and just chase costly mistake, 
not just chase costly mistakes. In previous hearings, we heard that emergency short-term contracting gave way to longer contingency agreements. Then many sustain, uh, sustainment contracts were entered into using full and open competition. The process needs to mature and stabilize even further. I hope these hearings help us get to that end. We are looking for a slope to the acquisition learning curve, evidence that lessons learned are being applied. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. By uh, the announcement yesterday, all members who made an opening statement uh, uh, will not be called on today for an opening statement. Uh, Mr. Towns was not here yesterday and has requested that he be given an opportunity for an opening statement. Mrs. Fox was Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I had a conflict um, yesterday and, of course, um, was unable to be present. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings on waste, fraud and abuse in Federal contracting. Today's hearing focuses on military contracts in Iraq. But the problem identified are not unique to the Pentagon or the war. In fact, we see exactly the same type of waste in contracts of Hurricane Katrina and in other areas. The American people in Congress have been very, very generous. But not nearly enough of the money has been sent into the places that need the help, especially the victims of Katrina. One of the biggest problems I see, Mr. Chairman, and something that I plan to look into um, in my subcommittee as the chair, the layers and layers and layers of middle men each taking a cut of the money before it gets to the people who are actually doing the work. If we could cut out these middle men and middle women, we could get more funds applied to the problems we are trying to solve and save some money while we are dealing with the problem. This problem is more than just wasted dollars. With so many layers of subcontractors, the government cannot monitor the work and hold people accountable. This absence of accountability has real, real human costs. People who lost homes in Hurricane Katrina tell us how many different contractors they had to deal with just to get a trailer to live in or to put a roof over their heads. And relatives of Blackwater employees will tell us today how the lack of oversight and planning can contribute to a tragedy. Mr. Chairman, I'm glad that we have the chance today to question some contractors and finally do some oversight. But the same type of wasteful contracting happens so often that this is not just a problem with a few bad apples. The federal contracting system is broken and we must fix it. In this Congress, we need to pass a bill that closes loopholes and requires more competition. We need to take oversight and control out of the hands of huge contractors and have government officials supervising the people who are actually doing the work. And we need to make sure that we are not outsourcing work that should be done by government employees. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and with the members of this committee on both sides of the aisle to pass some real contracting reform as soon as possible. On that note, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I am eager to hear from the witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Towns. The Chair would note that Ms. Fox uh, did not have an opportunity for an opening statement yesterday. I want to see if she wishes to make one today. I do, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for this opportunity. As our country engages in a historic struggle against evil and terror, some publicly question whether our efforts are being properly administered and operated. While constructive criticism and genuine critical analysis help ensure transparency and proper management, some partisan rhetoric can actually compromise the good work that is being accomplished in places like Iraq. Many contractors operating in Iraq have been subjected to a great deal of scrutiny. While I understand there may be some waste as contractors operate in a war zone, a vast majority of the work done by our military contractors is praiseworthy. American contractors deliver critical supplies, infrastructure and security in an incredibly hostile environment. 
One of these contractors, Blackwater USA, is headquartered in my home state of North Carolina. Today they are facing accusations of negligence and profiteering, but I see another side of this company that often remains unmentioned in the media. For example, many Blackwater security personnel were previously honorable law enforcement and military personnel, professionals. These folks are well trained and well equipped as they work tirelessly side by side with our military as they pursue victory over vicious, heartless attacks of violence. Furthermore, in response to emerging threats arising in the war on terror, Blackwater is developing a number of technologies which can serve to protect our brave servicemen and women fighting overseas. Given the tremendous personal sacrifices and acts of patriotism made every day by the brave folks who work for contractors such as Blackwater, I hope that today's hearing will provide an opportunity for a fair defense against some of the accusations which have been leveled against them. I look forward to the testimony of today's witnesses. And I want to add one comment to these prepared statements. I appreciate very much what Mr. Towns was saying about how um, we should be looking at waste, fraud, and abru abuse throughout the federal government. I will tell you that this is an issue near and dear to my heart. But one of the problems that we have is we are doing too much at the federal level. And Congress is not uh, exercising its appropriate oversight uh, authorities. And I think many times we're working with uh, systems that simply don't work, having hearing after hearing is not as productive as it should be uh, in terms of our looking at that. But I think one of our biggest problems is that the federal government tries to do things it's got no business doing, and we simply cannot do the proper oversight, and we need to reduce the role of the federal government instead of increasing the role of the federal government. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. We'll now uh, uh, turn to the witnesses, but before that, we have a um, a, uh, a memo that's been circulated to uh, the uh, members of the committee. It's uh, additional information for hearing on private security contractors, and without objection, we'd like to make that part of the record. We'll receive uh, testimony from the first panel witnesses, and let me introduce them. On March 31, 2004, four men working as private security personnel for Blackwater USA were se securing a convoy when they were killed as they traveled through Fallujah. These brave and patriotic men were Scott Helveston, Wesley Batalona, Jerry Zovko, and Michael Teague. We have with us today family members of all four men. Kathy Helveston Wettengel is the mother of Scott Helveston. Scott was a former Navy SEAL and a SEAL instructor, a world-class athlete, and the father of two young children. Donna Zofko is the mother of Jerry Zofko, a former Army Ranger who was fluent in four languages and was just 32 at the time of his death. Rhonda Teague is the widow of Michael Teague, who was also survived by his son. Mike had served as a member of the Army's elite helicopter unit known as the Night Stalkers. He had completed tours of duty in Afghanistan, Panama, and Grenada. He was awarded the Bronze Star. Crystal. Badalona is the daughter of Wesley Badalona, a 20-year veteran of the Army Rangers who took part in the 1989 invasion of Panama, the first Gulf War in 1991, and the 1993 humanitarian mission in Somalia. Ms. Badalona heard the news of her father's death on her 22nd birthday. Before we begin, I would like to express my um, on behalf of myself and the entire committee, our, our deepest condolences, our hearts go out to all of you for your loss. As Americans, we all felt the pain that came across uh, when we saw the horrific images, but none of us can truly know your anguish and loss. And second, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Just like your husbands, your fathers, and your sons, you are also very brave to testify before Congress. It's not an e easy thing to do, so we thank you very much for it. Um, it's the custom of this committee to swear in all witnesses that appear before us, so if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to stand. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. The record will note that uh, each of the witnesses acted in the affirmative. Um, 
Mr. Chairman. I've invited all of you to be here today. I understand that uh, you have a joint statement and that all four of you sign and want to provide to the committee. Uh, normally, we'd give you just uh, each witness five minutes, but if one of you would like to read the statement, uh, we'd like to recognize you to do that and to take as much time as you need to, do, to uh, read the statement. Mr. Chairman, I'd like unanimous consent to place into the record two documents uh, pertinent to uh, this hearing. One addressed to you and Mrs. Pelosi, uh, in which it's cited that th this that hearing should go after the uh, Blackwater, the serious uh, Lee by extremely Republican companies such as Blackwater, and secondly, a memorandum of the funds given uh, specifically to Democratic causes by the law firm that represents these three women. Hmm. Okay. We, uh, have you had a chance to review them? Uh, we'll, ex without objection. Thank you, Mr. We'll Chairman. We'll accept those and make them part of the record. Uh, please proceed however you wish, and thank you very much for being here. If, th if you would, there's a button on the base of the mic, press it in, and then pull the mic as close to you as possible. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I would like to start off by sincerely thanking the committee for inviting each of the families of the four men who were killed in Fallujah. Although everyone remembers those images of the bodies being burnt, beaten, dragged through the streets, and ultimately hung up from a bridge, we continue to relive that horror day after day, as those men were our fathers, sons, and husbands. Following that horrific incident, on March 31, 2004, we turned to Blackwater for answers. What we received was appalling. We were told that the information surrounding the circumstances in which our loved ones were killed was confidential. When we insisted on seeing the report concerning the incident, Blackwater told us that we would have to sue them to get it. Having just lost the most important people in our lives, a lawsuit was the last thing on our minds. Instead, our focus was concentrated on finding out just what happened. However, the people in the best position to tell us what happened refused to do so. It was not as if Blackwater was claiming that it did not know what happened, but instead Blackwater concealed the information from us that we needed so desperately to understand why our loved ones were dead. Imagine having the people so near and dear to your hearts killed overseas in a foreign country, and then having his or her employer tell you that the details are confidential and that it would take a lawsuit to turn the information over. There is no accountability for the tens of thousands of contractors working in Iraq and abroad. People Private contractors, like Blackwater, work outside the scope of the military's chain of command and can literally do whatever they please without any liability or accountability from the U.S. government. I wonder if you just might move the, move the mic just a little bit back away. Is it too close? Me. Yeah, too close. Okay. Thank you. I'm not familiar with speaking on microphones. You're doing, you're doing just fine. Okay. Okay. Let me, they, they also work in countries like Iraq, which are not currently capable of enforcing the law and prosecuting wonderful, wrongful conduct, such as murder. Therefore, Blackwater can continue accepting hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money from the government without having to answer a single question about its security operators. It is our understanding that Blackwater has lost more operators than any other U.S. security company working in Iraq. The inherent flaw in the manner in which private contractors are being used is that there is no accountability or oversight. If the U.S. military was performing the job that is now farms out to the private sector, there would always be someone to answer to, all the way up to the President of the United States. More importantly, those in the chain of command would be looking out for the best interests of the soldiers and their country. 
In the case of Blackwater, the people making critical decisions are those in corporate America, whose focus is often on cutting costs and making profit. When the decision was met, made to save millions of dollars by not buying armored vehicles, our husbands, fathers, and sons were killed. Blackwater gets paid by the number of warm bodies it can put on the ground in certain locations throughout the world. If some are killed, it replaces them at a moment's notice. What Blackwater fails to realize is that the commodity it trades in is human life. Well, maybe just a statistic to Blackwater, the four men killed in Fallujah were exceptional special forces who collectively gave decades of military service to our country. My son, Scotty, became the youngest Navy SEAL ever at the age of 17. He was fluent in five dialects of Spanish. He served as a Navy SEAL from Europe to Central and South America. He helped train embassy staffs and even set up the security for President Ronald Reagan's summit meeting in Venice, Italy. Before leaving the Navy, Scott rose to the level of teaching Navy SEAL courses and was ultimately offered a commission. Scott was also a gold medal winner at the World Pentathlon. That year he won two golds, a silver and a bronze out of five events. Mike Teague served in the U.S. Army for 15 years in the 160th Special Operations Community. He had de deployed in Panama, Granada, Spain, Somalia, and other places that constantly immersed him in covert operations. As a civilian, Mike taught gun training classes for the state of Tennessee, provided security for high-profile celebrities and athletes, and worked as a police officer for the Federal Reserve. He was reactivated during the war in Iraq and spent 12 months in the Army Special Forces in Afghanistan. Jerry Zovko and Wesley Badalona were similarly uh, former Special Forces with the U.S. Army. Jerry was a member of the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division in the Army Rangers. He served in Bosnia the Sin and the Sinai Peninsula. Wesley joined the Army after high school and quickly became an Army Ranger. He gave 20 years of service to our country by serving all around the world. The talents of highly skilled Special Forces personnel do not always translate well into civilian life. However, Blackwater provided a high-paying alternative to the routine jobs that former military personnel usually uh, resort to. Blackwater offered our men $600 per day to work private security in Iraq. More importantly, Blackwater also promised our men certain protections which were critical in determining whether to accept such a high-paying job to work in a war zone. Our four men were told that they would be working in armored vehicles with no less than six operators in each detail. They were supposed to be at least three people in each vehicle. This would have provided for a driver, a navigator, and a rear gunner who would have heavy machine guns to fight off any attacks. Our men were also told that they would be able to learn the routes through Iraq prior to going on any missions and to conduct a risk assessment of each mission to determine if it was too dangerous to go. Blackwater did not provide our men with any of these protections. It is undisputed that they did not have armored vehicles. They did not have a team of six. They did not have three people per vehicle. They did not have a rear gunner. They did not have heavy machine weapons. They were not able to conduct a risk assessment of the mission. They did not have a chance to learn the routes before going on the mission. In fact, when Scotty asked for a map of the route, he was told, it is too little, it is, it's a little too late for a map now. Ultimately, all four men died before the contract they were working under was even scheduled to begin. <sighs> Lack of preparation and the strive to make as much money as quickly as possible, even if not 100% ready, is Blackwater's style of business. This style was confirmed just, months, um, just last month when Blackwater's president, Gary Jackson, told the Harvard Business Review Quote, I constantly push for the 80% solution that is executable now 
over the 100% solution we might be able to devise in another three weeks, unquote. An 80% solution means that 20% of the operators are dead. Blackwater actually lost nine of its 34 operators in just over two months. That means that only 74% survived, which is pretty close to Blackwater's goal of 80%. Our men were told that they would be performing work that would make a difference, such as guarding Ambassador Paul Bremer. Instead, they died escorting empty trucks that were going to pick up kitchen equipment. Once the men signed on with Blackwater and were flown to the Middle East, Blackwater treated them as fungible commodities. For example, Scotty was physically and verbally attacked one night by a Blackwater program manager. When Scotty indicated that he was not well enough to leave the following morning on the mission, despite two other Blackwater operators offering to go in, in Scott's place, the Blackwater manager burst into Scott's room late at night, confiscated his weapon, and told Scotty that if he personally did not go on, on the mission the following day, he would be fired. It was under this threat of being fired and abandoned in Iraq that forced Scott to leave for Baghdad the following morning. However, late that night, Scott sent his last email. It was addressed to the owner, president, and upper management of Blackwater Security. The treatment of the security operators was so bad that after working for Blackwater for just 11 days, Scott felt compelled to write an email to the owner and president of the company that began. It is with deep regret and remorse that I send you this email. During my short tenure here with Blackwater, I have witnessed and endured some extreme unprofessionalism." Unquote. In this lengthy email, Scott detailed all of the problems with the entire program and the treatment of the operators. There was no response from Blackwater's management to, to this call for help. Instead, our men were dead four days later. After the incident, Blackwater held a small memorial service for our men and the other Blackwater operators who were killed. During our time at the Blackwater compound, there were guards assigned to each of the families. The guards were with us at all times and did not let us speak with the other family members in private. Ultimately, Blackwater refused to tell us anything about how our men died. For six months after the incident, Blackwater did not return telephone calls or inquiries about the incident. Ultimately, I tracked down a direct number for Blackwater's owner, Eric Prince. When I called it, Mr. Prince actually answered the phone. We had a brief conversation, and I asked Mr. Prince for a copy of Scott's contract in the incident report. He told me that I should receive them uh, within a couple of weeks. No documents ever came. Although Blackwater told us that we would have to file a lawsuit to obtain a copy of the incident report, Blackwater has done everything possible to prevent the disclosure of any information. During the past two years that the lawsuit has been pending, Blackwater has not answered a single question or produced a single document. Instead, Blackwater has appealed, applied every single ruling all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. When we attempted to take the de deposition of a key witness, Blackwater sent him out of the country just days before his deposition. When he recently returned to the United States after working for Blackwater for the past two years, we obtained another court order to take his deposition. Blackwater has now appealed that order as well. Thus far in our legal quest, Blackwater has hired five different law firms to fight us, including such political politically connected lawyers as Fred Fielding, White House Counsel, and Kenneth Starr. It appears that Blackwater will go to any lengths to prevent us from finding out why our men were killed and to avoid any accountability for its actions. Through it all, Blackwater has never denied that it was obligated to provide our men with certain protections. More importantly, Blackwater has never decided uh, that it did not provide Wait a minute. Blackwater, excuse me, let me repeat this. Blackwater has never denied that it did not provide our men with these protections. 
Instead, Blackwater has simply said that it cannot be sued for its conduct. As appalling as it may seem, Blackwater also recently filed a $10 million claim against us for bringing our lawsuit. First and foremost, we are seeking answers from Blackwater as to how and why our loved ones are dead. Why were they not in armored vehicles? Why were they not in a team of six? Why were there not three operators in each vehicle? Why were there not provided heavy weapons? Why were they not permitted to learn the routes? in Iraq before going on their mission? Why were they not allowed to gather intelligence from the outgoing security company? Why was a risk assessment not performed prior to that mission? Why were they not given 24 hours notice before their mission? Why were they lost in the middle of Iraq? Why did they drive through the center of Fallujah at a time when even US military would not go through? Why were they lied to about the weapons and protections they would have? In short, why did Blackwater choose to make a profit over the safety of our loved ones? Second, we are seeking accountability for the wrongful conduct of Blackwater. Private contractors such as Blackwater are being paid millions of dollars of our taxpayer money to line their own pockets and jeopardize the safety of the men and women working for them. There needs to be accountability for their conduct. While Blackwater is a private North Carolina company and should be held to answer to North Carolina jury, the government should also create some type of accountability and service uh, and oversight for private contractors. Third, we are seeking to prevent other families from receiving that dreadful telephone call explaining that a father, a son, or a husband has been killed. If the message is sent throughout the industry that private contractors will be held accountable for their wrongful conduct abroad, the companies may devote more attention to the safety of their workers and less to the amount of their profits. Having lost those close to our hearts and then having experienced the callous indifference of Blackwater, we sincerely hope that Congress will take action by creating accountability for the private contractors and not continue to allow them to make millions of dollars at the cost of the American lives. Thank you very much for that um, statement on behalf of all of you. I, uh, I know that up here we have the Democrats and we have the Republicans. I don't know whether you're Democrats or Republicans. I don't know whether your sons or husbands or uh, family members were Democrats and Republicans, and it doesn't make any difference. No, it doesn't. <laughs> they were American patriots. They were veterans of our armed services. And we want to know some of the things that you want to know, uh, because we ought to know what's happening with our young men and women who are in the military and who are in the front line risking their lives working for private contractors paid by the United States taxpayers. So we want to get some of the answers to some of the same questions, but we have a, an obligation beyond that to the taxpayers of this country to know how this whole operation works where you have a contractor, a subcontractor, a sub subcontractor, and who is responsible. Who is accountable? If your loved ones had been members of the military put into a battle, I, I, I can't imagine you would have had to go through all that you seem to have had to go through just to get answers to what happened to them. It's really inconceivable uh, to me. I agree. It's unconscionable. Let me ask you some questions because we're trying to get a record which we'll share with our colleagues and help us um, get the information that we need to try to understand what's been happening. Um, some of these questions you may have the answers to, some you may not. And I'm asking anybody in, on the panel who wants to uh, give us uh, their views. Were your family members traveling in armored vehicles the day in Fallujah uh, that when they were killed, to your knowledge? They were Mitsubishi, Pajeros, with reinforced back bumpers. And how about the number of team members that were in each vehicle? Well, when they originally started to pull out, there were three. At the last minute, 
Justin McGowan pulled out the rear gunner in each vehicle, claiming that they needed to have them there to help them do some clerical work. What was that third person supposed to do in the vehicle? He was the one that would save them if they got in trouble. He was the one to protect them. Did they have um, machine guns? I don't think Scotty ever got his own gun back. I don't think uh, the navigators fired one, one bullet. Uh, the people in Fallujah literally just walked up to these vehicles and shot them at point blank range. But then what they did after was just so horrendous. Mm -hmm. Scotty lived a short while after the initial shooting. I was told he was still alive when they tied him to the back of that truck and drug him through the streets of Fallujah. And that was before they decapitated him, dismembered him, and torched him. Do, do you know whether they had a, I assume that if I there's have any no difference. Idea. Uh, I know they didn't have the If there's any difference guns. among the others, because what you're saying, I assume you're speaking for all of the. Uh, well, that's, the, no, ask them if, if yeah. it's, it was in any If there are any differences, you? please um, let us know. Did they have maps of the area? Not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Be sure you press in the button. So we I'm not read. aware that they had any maps. Did any of you know whether they had I, I was told Scott specifically asked for a map, and he was told it was too late for a map. So it, it appears from what all four of you know is they were traveling. They were not traveling in armored vehicles. They were traveling in teams of two in cars instead of three, and they didn't have a rear gunner. And they didn't have heavy machine guns, and they didn't have a map. Is that a correct That statement? is my understanding. All of you agree. And you believe it was Blackwater's responsibility to provide these items to your family members, is that right? Well, by just removing uh, the armored vehicle, I was told it gave Blackwater a profit of 1.5 million. Well, we, we don't know. That's something you've heard. Yeah. yeah. I'm unsure of the profit um, gained by not providing these men with armored vehicles, but I have watched extensive footage of other contractors in Iraq taking heavy fire in fully armored vehicles that can sustain 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and that's a possibility that our men could have gotten out that we'll never know because they did not have those. You've wanted to know information from um, Blackwater. What, what information did you want to get from Blackwater that you still feel you haven't ha received? Uh, I, I think, uh, Mrs. Zofko, you had some specific information. Is that right? Well, There's a button on that. Questions. Uh, not information, but questions. Uh, so what, pull the mic a little closer. What uh, and why were they sent on a... There's a button on the mic. Is it pressed I in? did. It's yeah. green. Oh, okay. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Um, what led them into the um, mission that they were going to or uh, the job that they were on for three days or four days prior than the contract actually going into the effect? Why not prepare them? Not, why not give them time to prepare and get to know the route? All of these things that they were supposed to have been allowed to do prior to doing the job. So, uh, 1,001 questions and no answers. Did you talk to anybody from Blackwater? Uh, did I? Uh, yes, yeah, actually, um, I did. When um, on March 31st, in the late evening, I spoke to a young woman by the name of Susan, uh, who had, after three phone calls, confirmed that yes, Mr. Prince will be coming to our house to tell us that our son was dead, and um, had talked to her a couple of times about the body coming home. Um, and then all of a sudden she disappeared. Uh, the only contact and good years that I had there uh, to listen to me were not there anymore. I've lost contact with them. Uh, my son had, uh, Tom had uh, talked to Blackwater and uh, had communicated with them more so than I did after that. Um, I met with uh, the Blackwater employees at the um, memorial that they had in October which is six months after the death of my son. And um, after that, nothing. Uh, in, the, in the joint statement, one, at least one of you was told to sue Blackwater in order to get information. Yes, who, who, um, is that something that yes, was told to you? Yes, and told us to sue. There was, uh, I was under the impression that all the families, the families of um, 
my Jerry's co-workers and the families of the uh, other young men that were killed that worked for Blackwater in Iraq will have the opportunity to go into this boardroom uh, meeting for uh, answers and questions, actually. That's the impression that I was under. Well, after lunch and after everything that we um, went through that we did at the Blackwater facilities, uh, we, my husband, my son, and I were ex supported to um, this meeting to where it was only the three of us and four of the Blackwater employees. Um, there was no questions and answers, Did they, really. But what, tell me about somebody telling you you have to sue them. And to told us, my husband was mm -hmm. asking where are my son's personal things, where are things that belong to my son, how did my son uh, die? Uh, and she said that that was confidential. It was the information that if we wanted to know, we needed to sue. And she actually was sitting on this part of the table, at the end of the table, or ahead of the table. We were on the side. She stood up and she said that if we wanted to know that, that we needed to sue. That was confidential. And was there anybody else there in that room from Blackwater? Uh, yes, there was uh, Mr. Rush. There was uh, that's Mike Rush. Yes, uh, there was. Um, he's a very senior Blackwater official, according to our information, and uh, he's the deputy director for operations at their uh, North Carolina headquarters. What did he have to say? Maybe at that time he wasn't so high in the uh, mm -hmm. position and chain of command, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, but no, he was the person that we have met that had spent time uh, with the families and he was sitting there, he was sitting to the right of Anne and right next to him was a gentleman by the first name of Dave that was the fastest gun, mind you, the fastest gun in Iraq. That was a joke. Okay, this is supposed to make me feel like smiling or laughing because we're sitting at this table and they're introducing this gentleman that just came back from Iraq and he was the fastest gun in Iraq. Yeah. I, I yeah. but we were told to sue and we had gotten no information. We did receive a um, copy of a flag that people that live near the uh, Blackwater headquarters have made for our sons or it could have been the employees of Blackwater that were in Baghdad in Iraq. But it did have uh, my, Jerry's, my son Jerry's name, Scotty's, Wes's, and Mike's on that flag. And that was the only thing that we have gotten out of that uh, answers and questions session with Blackwater. Thank you. I would like to add something about that flag. It was crocheted by a 70-some-year-old woman that lived near the Blackwater compound. And she, she crocheted, it's a very large flag, but Blackwater had nothing to do with that. She just wanted to do something, and she thought that might help us feel better. Yeah. Thank you. But Ron. Blackwater had nothing to do with it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, I want to recognize you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I join uh, Chairman Waxman in uh, expressing our appreciation for their patriotism and trying to honor their memories in an appropriate fashion. I. We're, I'm having a hard time even understanding the contractual vehicle as we look at all the documents, too. If this was an ESS log cap or ESS floor, they were a fourth or fifth tier contract, subcontractor. I hope we can get to the bottom of that. The one question I have is we understand it. Families ought to be entitled to and receive compensation under the insurance that contractors are required uh, to carry pursuant to the Defense Base Act. Uh, have each of you received those benefits? Uh, the wid widows and, and minor children receive those benefits. Is that right? Correct. No, I, don't, I don't receive any. I personally never applied for those benefits. That has been brought to my attention several times um, as we've asked questions. That to me has nothing to do with who's accountable for not providing the things to my husband and those other men that they were promised for their protection. I agree. Receive no benefits. Okay. My mother receives benefits. Okay, thank you. That's but all my questions. Do we have any questions? That's all. That's all. Any questions? I'll yield to Miss. I'll yield to Mr. Ison. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess I have one opening question. Well, first a comment. Uh, although I don't think your testimony today is particularly germane to 
the oversight of this committee. Uh, I am uh, deeply sorry to, for the losses that you've uh, had. Camp Pendleton's the center of my district, and so Fallujah was particularly painful for all of us in the community there because during the same period, obviously, uh, the Camp Pendleton Marines were heavily engaged in a dangerous zone. Uh, one question I have is the opening statement. Who wrote it? It was a compilation of all four of us. We all sent them our, our thoughts and feelings to Dan Callahan, and he compiled it because we were told we only had five minutes. And so we had to, I have my own personal no, statement. It, it, was, like it was well written, and I, I asked because it did appear as though it was written by an attorney mm -hmm. who had obviously slipped in a lot of things that they believe would be facts in the lawsuit now pending. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, I think it's regrettable that uh, a family should have to uh, sue to get, get information. Uh, I guess one question, all four of these men were experienced, uh, seasoned people who understood the military and law enforcement. Is that fair to say? Yes. In a sense, and hearing some of the biographies, these were people who would have been able to set policy, set uh, the uh, terms, if you will. Now, I see you shaking your head, but it, think about this before you answer. These are people who, in fact, trained other people, particularly Scotty. Uh, so you, as I understand, what we're talking about are professionals, highly skilled, going into a combat situation with experience about combat. Would that be fair to say? No experience would have protected them that day. No, well, but that's not the question. Were these four well, They were ones very of yours? experienced. They were definitely. Okay. I, I, mean, I think it's important because one thing that is legitimate to this committee's oversight is does Blackwater, who I don't know from Adam basically, but do they hire top notch skilled professionals uh, that come prepared with skills commensurate with those of the U.S. military if they're to do similar jobs. And may, may I answer that? Yes, please. Well, they do hire very highly trained people, but they also are in Africa, in these little villages, hiring these men that make $30 a month and uh, are told that if they die that their families will get a million dollars. And uh, there's a man from Africa that came and interviewed me. I've done interviews from two of them from Korea because they're hiring there. Sure, sure, but, you, uh, but you're experts on your children, your husbands, your love, your father, your loved ones. They were highly qualified, they highly they skilled. They were. were the type that we should want to have doing security and assisting our military in this combat zone. Would that be fair to say for all four? Those four were very highly trained, but I cannot say that it's the case for all of Black, Blackwater's employees. Well, it's a great loss, obviously, to you and, and yes. for the work that they were doing. I'm a widow. And I'd like to thank you for the service they provided and, and again, express our, our sympathies for their loss. I yield back. May I just I want to take exception to the idea that it's not germane to our inquiry. If taxpayers are paying for layers and layers and layers of private bureaucracy, and if somebody who's getting taxpayers' dollars tells even highly trained American veterans that they're going to have body armor, they're going to have armed vehicles, or they're going to have special people with them to help them carry out their job, we ought to know whether they failed to do that because of indifference or negligence or incompetence. That is very much our job in oversight. It seems to me sometimes we, those who are criticizing our oversight didn't think we were actually going to do oversight. This is part of our job. Well, Mr. the gentleman Ch yelled for just a second. Oh, well, let me ask unanimous consent uh, that Ms. Schakowsky, who's not a member of this committee, be able to sit with us without objection out of the order. I, I, I do want to recognize members Can in, I just, in, uh, in that regard. Yes. I also wanted to take exception to the question about who wrote the, the testimony, because I think clearly the implication was that somehow these wonderful women couldn't possibly have written that wonderful, heartfelt testimony and that it took a lawyer in order to, to, to put it together. And I resent that very much and I wanted to just put okay. that on the record. I Thank you. I my personal Thank you. testimony if you'd like to see it. Okay. Well, whatever you have, we'll be happy to receive for the record. Mr. Tierney. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In your testimony that was given, uh, you had a written question that you wanted Blackwater to answer. It essentially was, why did Blackwater not listen to its own manager in charge in Kuwait, who had warned of all the problems well in advance of, of the deaths of, of your uh, relatives? Uh, Ms. Halverson Wettingel, who is this manager? The, Justin McGowan was his immediate I'm superior. Sorry, I hear. His name was Justin McGowan. He was Scott's immediate superior. And what concerns did he raise with Blackwater? Uh, it's John Potter. He was asking the concerns John Potter raised. John John, okay, um, John Potter. Mr. Potter. Uh, uh, what was, concerns did Mr. Potter raise with Blackwater? Apparently, it's my understanding that um, the guarantees that were given to our four men were not allowed in a subsequent con contract that was signed with ESS. In the ESS contract, they deleted the, the word armored. They deleted the word armor? Yes. From the vehicles and from the... In the ESS contract that Blackwater signed after uh, Scotty had signed his contract. And you've had some difficulty getting answers to these questions from Blackwater, so what was their response to Mr. Potter's concerns, if you know? I, I really... Well, they fired him initially. They fired him? Initially, yeah, because he, he was very upset because the, the name, the word armored was deleted. And he argued for that. He said, we have to have armored vehicles. And uh, he subsequently was fired. Okay. And have you had any communications with him since he was fired by Blackwater? Yes. Okay. And you know where he is? Yes. Okay. Now, you brought a lawsuit against the company, and their response was what? They were outraged that we had the audacity to sue them. They, they claimed that they cannot be sued because they're a defense contractor. And did they take any action against you? Uh, personally, $10 million. $10 million is something kind of personal. The countersuit? Yeah, okay. it's pretty personal. And if I understand it, their countersuit asserts that you had no right to sue them under the terms of the contract and therefore you're responsible to them for $10 million? Yeah, basically. And where in the court process is that suit and countersuit right now? How far along are you? It, that's, that was fairly recently that they did that. Um, I, don't, I don't know how far it's progressed. Now, if, if I discuss with you... Well, after three years, they've yet to give us any kind of document or deposition. That's exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. So your, your lawyers have asked for written documents to be produced. We've received nothing. And you received nothing. Have you had depositions uh, at times we come in before? Well, at one point, um, Mark Miles, who is, is, uh, works with Dan on this case, he uh, flew all the way to Norfolk. Uh, he had all the scheduled, way to Norfolk? Norfolk. He had deposed a number of Blackwater employees, and um, they just didn't show. And so Mark sat in this hotel room for two and a half days, and he kept um, faxing their attorney, saying at least give me the courtesy, if no one's going to show all the way through Friday, please just let me know, sign it, and I'll go home. And after I think it was the third day, they finally gave him that courtesy, just that nobody that had been deposed would be there. In the course of your lawsuit, uh, do you know whether or not your counsel have sought to uh, have documents produced by any government agency, the Department of Defense, for instance, or I, taken any testimony from any government individuals? I, I have no knowledge. I'm not saying that they didn't. I just have no knowledge of it. Okay. Well, I want to thank all, all of you for your testimony today and to say how sorry we all are. That I think most people in this country, if not all, understand that while your family members may have been serving as private individuals or citizens in this case, uh, that they were working in the interest of our country. And, and we all feel that they deserve the same protections and regard uh, as people in the military, whether from our own Department of Defense or from their uh, their contracting agent. So uh, you have our sympathy. They were all Thank very you. proud, patriotic men I'm sure who loved were. their country. As are you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah. Uh, well, I was out of the room voting in judiciary. I understand that there was a, what I would consider a disparaging comment implying that my question to the witness was related to having been a woman outside the ordinary course of business. Would that be correct? Well, it's not a, an adequate point of order, but do you want to make a statement? I would like to have the words taken down. 
Uh, we'll uh, check with the parliamentarian to see if that's appropriate in a committee. But meanwhile, we have witnesses here, and I want to pursue. The I look forward to hearing your testimony, Mr. Westmoreland. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Platt. Speak, Congressman Waxman. Yes. I, I would just like to go back uh, for a second <clears throat> to point simply to try to make it a little bit clearer about his the congressman's point in these are men that are highly skilled, familiar with combat, the kind of men you would want um, in these positions, and I agree with that. But I don't, I don't know if this was made clear. All four of these men had not been with Blackwater. My husband had been with them. Literally, I put him on the plane March 26th. He arrived in Kuwait March 29th, and he was killed March 31st. Had never done a mission with Blackwater before, OK? Her son had been with Blackwater 11 days. Her son, about three months, I believe. Two weeks. Two weeks. So here you have four men, highly skilled, yes, understand combat, yes. But they're sent out on a mission, my understanding, no map, no prior time to assess the situation. Could someone that has not worked with this company for some time go with them or help them or sort of be, you know, the, take the lead in that? We all, you are all very well versed in this community and in this building. But if you've never been here before, wouldn't you need someone to show you a few things? So whether they're highly skilled or not does not take away from providing them with maybe the, just the operations of that company. That, that's different than active military. There's several things that were different uh -huh. that they were not privy to. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a good clarifying point. Mr. Plants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would no, like to make no. one more statement. <laughs> Respond in the question okay. period. And, uh, and then if you, want to answer, if you want to make a statement, I'm sure that those of us who are proceeding with questions would be pleased to allow you to do that. Mr. Plants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, no question, just uh, convey my deep sympathies to you and your families on the loss and for the uh, service of your loved ones to our nation and to the cause of freedom. I'm having trouble hearing you, sir. I say uh, no question, just uh, convey my sympathies to you and your families on your loss and to the sacrifices that your loved ones made uh, to our nation and uh, to the cause of freedom. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to thank Ranking Member Davis for, for helping on this. Uh, first of all, very appreciative that you have come here today to help the committee with its work. Uh, I do want to go to the germaneness issue because it's been raised by my colleague. Uh, first of all, we've got a situation here where there's a growing tendency for uh, the military or for the administration to subcontract out work that has traditionally been performed by our military, uh, instead using uh, private contractors. And while <clears throat> the, the very <clears throat> the tangled uh, web of uh, subcontractors and sub-subcontractors <clears throat> has been noted here this morning, uh, it certainly is germane when American citizens are putting in a, put in a very difficult situation without uh, adequate protection. With respect to the gentleman's con comments. He initially raised the fact that the germaneness may not be uh, to this committee's jurisdiction, but may instead be connected to a civil lawsuit. That was the gentleman's comments. And then the question was whether or not the opening statement of the witnesses here had been drafted by a lawyer, presumably for the, with the same lawsuit. That was the that was the inference that was left here. Uh, I've, only, I've only been a member here for five years. Uh, I've only sat through several hundred, maybe a thousand hearings, and that is the first time as a member of Congress that I have heard any witnesses ask who wrote their opening statements. And I might say also that if that question is a fair one, then you might ask how many members up here at this table wrote their own opening statements. <laughs> You might be surprised at those answers, uh, but but I, I do want to I, I do want to I do want to ask the witnesses this. There's an inference here uh, by the attorney for Blackwater in a letter they've presented to us that uh, that by coming forward and and filing a lawsuit on behalf of your loved ones, and I you know. 
I've been to Fallujah a couple of times. I've actually been under escort with, uh, with Blackwater security forces in, in Afghanistan as well. So I understand how brave your, your loved ones were and how, how patriotic they were with the same fervor that those who, who same patriotism that those who serve in our, in, in American military uniforms. I understand that. Uh, but the inference is there in the letter from Blackwater's counsel that, that by their contract, somehow your husbands, sons, brothers gave away the right for you to sue in the event that, that negligence uh, or extreme negligence caused their death. Uh, can you tell me where that, where that comes from? They were also guaranteed certain provisions. Had they had any of those provisions, I know in my heart they would be alive today. But every, the few minor things that they were promised when they took that employment were taken away from them, every single one of them. If they'd had that armored vehicle, if they'd had that rear gunner, if they'd had a map, it's, uh, I, I think it's referred to as a, is it a black zone or a red zone? The military would not even go on in there with the heaviest equipment over there. It was so dangerous. And, and, I, and I do realize at this point when their caravan, their, their convoy had gone through Fallujah, the Marines hadn't been into central Fallujah uh, before uh, your, your husbands and your loved ones uh, took that convoy through. But uh, with respect to the, the inference that there's a bar on your lawsuit because of the contract that your loved ones signed, is there any more information that you have on that? And I realize that uh, there are allegations and there's certainly evidence that Blackwater didn't fulfill their part of the contract, but uh, this bar on your lawsuit, is that, that's something that concerns me for other employees in the same situation that your, your loved ones were in. I want to try to make sure that there's no there's no assertion to other families that they can't bring lawsuits uh, because of something that was put in that contract. I'm not familiar with this bar that you refer to. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Okay. All right. Okay, that's fair Thank enough. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Mr. Issa, you're recognized on your own time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And perhaps I'll use a little of it to straighten out two things. Yes. My understanding is that uh, the U.S. Congress has put into law prohibitions on lawsuits uh, for our government contractors operating as agents of the U.S. government in a combat zone. Sir, sir I cannot answer any legal questions. I, no, no, I don't no, have I'm, the, and the I'm not asking. I'm, I'm making a statement just to set the record straight. I have reviewed some of that. Uh, and that bar uh, might be something that this and other committees should should look at, obviously, uh, when a company bids, they bid based on the assumption that relevant U.S. law would be there. In other words, that their losses would be limited to whatever they contracted for in the case of a death. Having said that, uh, I did ask an appropriate question, I believe, of who wrote the, uh, uh, the opening statement for you, not because it's without any. I mean, it's very common for uh, attorneys or organizations, uh, in-house people, to write opening statements. Why are you dwelling on that? I'm dwelling on it because, in fact, there is a real question, not as to whether or not we should oversee uh, Blackwater and other contractors, but the role of having you three bereaved women here. There's four of us. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. I'll, I, you know, it's a good thing I learned to count early, but not well. Having you here to tell us about your loss when, in fact, it's the subject of a lawsuit that's ongoing and, in fact, this committee has no jurisdiction here to change the outcome of your loss today or to settle your lawsuit. And why is that? We're subcontracting out our war. There, I understand there's 100,000 contractors over there and there doesn't seem to be a law that applies. They literally can get away with murder. And it's happening over and over. It didn't just happen to our four men. Well, it's like the Wild West over there. So and I would there is no accountability. Right. I would gather that all four of you would uh, like us to cease using contractors wherever possible. You think it inappropriate? Is that spoken for all of you? I, I have found it difficult to understand why they do, because they're paid so much more than the military. And the military resents them for that. 
They're taking jobs that the military had been trained to do, and they're giving it to Blackwater. And uh, they're being paid enormous amounts of money. And it's like a secret, secret army over there that the majority of Americans aren't aware of. But if you are going to subcontract out this war, then there needs to be some laws that apply to these people. Sir, I, I would like yes, to comment. Um, I think these questions are a bit leading, but I'd still like to comment. Uh, I think there's a need for contractors and subcontractors in this war. I, I have felt that. Um, I didn't want my husband to leave home again and work with Blackwater. It wasn't necessarily because it was Blackwater. I did not know as much about Blackwater. I was tired of my husband being gone. He felt it was his calling and it's what he should do. I don't feel that it necessarily it calls for there to be no contractors, no subcontractors, but you just made a point, a very valid point. When these contractors bid jobs to the Department of Defense and, and they do so under maybe some understanding that uh, they are above the law and that, that they can do this, do they also have to account for where all those billions of dollars go? Because I don't see where any of that's spent. I, I don't, I've never heard or had any account of where it's at. Well, that's, that's something that is, yeah, and I appreciate that. That is something that's very germane to this committee and something that we're very interested in. As you probably know, we're going to have Blackwater's Council here next. Uh, that will be one of the questions, is the money. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a small enclosure, in, enclosure into the record. During the same time that uh, your loved ones were there, March to August of 04, uh, one of my legislative assistants was there uh, with one of the provisional ministers in an unarmored vehicle with only a guard slash driver, the three of them in the car outside the green zone. It appears as though this has been a war that we thought wasn't a war, then we thought it was a war, then we thought it wasn't a war. And it is not uncommon uh, for these loved ones to be lost or put into danger when people are saying, well, they're not in danger. We had 3,000 people working in that sort of capacity. They were working for thirty-five dollars or $40,000 for the U.S. government at the time as USAID and other provisional authority. Uh, this is something that is appropriate to this committee to see whether or not we should have those kinds of people in those kinds of zones uh, with that kind of protection. And to that extent, I thank you for your testimony because I think to the extent that we do understand whether we have appropriately used contractors is very germane to this committee. And I yield back. Well, Blackwater has claimed from, from the beginning that they are exempt from all state and all federal laws. Yes, How can that be? Thank These you. are human beings they're dealing with, and they literally feel they cannot be sued regardless of what they have done. Mr. Kucinich is going to ask some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Waxman. And, and just uh, picking up on the uh, comments of the witness, if that's what we're told, is it characterizes Blackwater's way of operating, then it's basically anything goes. I'm sorry? If, if Blackwater operates the way you say they operate, then it's basically anything goes. If they're not there, bound by any laws at all. Exactly. That's the point I'm trying to make. And it, that's, I just wanted to make sure that uh, it came through uh, boldly because what you're saying is, you know, we, we see these witnesses uh, if effectively being impugned because they filed a lawsuit. Now, let me ask you, uh, the members of the families, were, were you motivated by money or were you motivated by accountability? Did you want to make sure that Blackwater was held accountable? I will not get one, one cent from this lawsuit. I refuse to take a penny. I would like accountability, sir, I, from the beginning. Same here. Zafko. Same, Same here. here. Just let them face what they have done and let them not do it to anyone else. Be accountable for what they have done. Uh, what I don't understand is how our government can hire corporations like Blackwater knowing that they refuse accountability. I mean, what, what does that say about us as a country, as a nation? See, see this needs to be known. This is, a, this is about a matter of the heart here. This isn't about people trying to get money. And because when you, when you, uh, when you see what these families have gone through, and even the courage it takes for them to come forward today, you know, this, this, this committee is very appreciative of you being here. And I, I just I have a qu couple questions that I want to ask the uh, uh, members of uh, the panel here. The, the practice of contracting out military operations in a war zone uh, to private security contractors, um, 
it's troubling, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Where, when the government first began turning to contractors on a battlefield, it was to provide meals and laundry and other services so the troops could focus on the fighting. It was so our soldiers could be what they called the tip of the spear. But today, we're hiring out contractors to be that tip of the spear. Now, here's what the head of Blackwater uh, said last December about his company's role. This is a quote. We're trying to do for the national security apparatus what FedEx did for the Postal Service. They did many of the same services that the Postal Service did, better, cheaper, smarter, and faster, by innovating, which the private sector can do much more effectively. That's a, that's a direct quote. For, now, he is makes, that from he Blackwater? Ma Pardon? Is that from Blackwater? That's Eric Prince. Okay. And so he makes clear that the private sector has a fundamentally different goal than our military. The private sector, it's the private sector that wants to make money. That's why some people could be seeing the world in their own image, claiming that you're here to make money. The private sector wants to make money. There's nothing wrong with that unless it comes in conflict with the goals of our military. Each of your loved ones spent years as the best of the best, the most elite in the U.S. military. Each of them and you were accustomed to military culture. So here's the question, uh, Ms. Zavko or, uh, or Ms. Uh, Helvenston uh, Wet uh, Wettingel, uh, what were some of the differences that you noticed between the U.S. military and Blackwater or f a for-profit business entity? Uh, when you're, for example, when your families were on active duty, what was the military more interested in, the safety of the troops or how cheaply it could carry out the mission? I'd, I'd like to hear your response to that. Donna, do you want to go first? Well, I know when my son Jerry was uh, in the Army, he was the best that he could be. He loved it, and he was taken care of and protected. He was to do his job, but he was given the tools to do it with. Um, he, he was the best of the best in the world, 82nd Airborne, MP Company, Ranger. He didn't lack anything. Well, his experience and his knowledge from the Army, he was going to use with Blackwater, but they shut off his arms and his legs. They just let him out there to die. They did not provide anything for him. He had his discipline. He has his know-how, the know, knowing the Middle East as he did, but they didn't give him the tools to work with. They just simply <laughs> sent him out there to die. They did. And, you know, if you do what you job requires you to do, and if you're making the laws, you're not making them only for our country, the America. It's the world that we make because we are the number one. My son was the number one. They're Blackwater and the companies like Blackwater. The, <clears throat> they are recruiting from other countries, and they are not paying them well enough or taking care of them well enough at all. So that needs to be seen. If we're going to police the world, then let's do it right. Let's start at home, taking care of what we need to do here and if, go if on I, with everything else. Uh, Mr. Zopko, uh, first of all, you know, to all of the witnesses, our, our deepest condolences for, to your family for what you've suffered. Uh, if you could make a final comment, uh, Mrs. Zopko, do you believe that Blackwater was more concerned about the safety of its personnel or how much profit it could make from the contract? Uh, it is profit. It is definitely profit, and I will go to my grave with believing that it was profit. They were not concerned about my son or his well-being or what he can do for them. It's what they could have charged for my son. Remember, our country had uh, given the tools to my son to be who he was. He was an ex-army person, a ranger, the best of the best, and they used him to get him killed. Thank you, and thank you to all the witnesses. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Shays? Thank you, uh, all four of you, for being here. I, um, we've had a number of hearings in the subcommittee that I chaired over the last few years, and I've been to Iraq 15 times. And I say that because I, I've been outside the umbrella of the military, where I've literally gone in a taxi, um, where I've gone in, uh, in a vehicle that unfortunately uh, was white and, you know, four-wheel drive and was a signal that, you know, there was probably European in it. And um, you knew intuitively the moment you got off the airplane in Iraq that you were in dangerous territory. What I'm wrestling with is this. First off, I want to tell you, uh, 
I, I find myself agreeing with a lot of different people who you disagree with and agreeing with you at the same time. And um, all four of you have a right to be outraged. Uh, you lost your loved ones. You have uh, an extraordinary right to be hurt. Um, the reason we paid contractors, what we paid them was so they could pay people who would make much more there than here. And a lot of people who went to Iraq went because they could make more money and they knew they were being put in harm's way. They could make two, three, four times as much. Not That's, if you're dead, I, they can't. They can't well, make a well, thing. Don't interrupt me, ma'am. Let me make my point and then you can make your point. Uh, and it depends which contractors there. I'm, you're interrupting me before you know where I agree or disagree. Just listen. And, and, and so people went there so, in fact, they could make additional money. And they knew they were in harm's way. And what we wanted is to make sure we sent the, the best trained people there, the contractors. One of the things that's not in dispute is all four of your family members were skilled and knew the risk and knew uh, what to do to deal with it. The issue is, were they being given the kind of, of um, assistance they needed to do their job properly? So one of the questions that it's raising for me is, did they have the capability to say, hell no, we're not going out there? Scotty and did say that, and he said he'd be fired. Please, please do not interrupt me. So I'm just throwing that out uh, as an issue. Did, it, were they, in fact, uh, capable? And if they did refuse, what would be the result? Would they be court-martialed or would they be asked to say, we don't want you to work here? And frankly, if you're a skilled person, you would say, I don't want to work here. Um, were they forced under a threat of some kind of court-martial not to carry out what they did? So what I'm saying, what is the value of what you're doing here in the course of this hearing is, one is we need to evaluate the role of contractors. They aren't the tip of the spear. The tip of the spear are the men and women in uniform who are going out and actively trying to root out the enemy. The whole purpose of contractors is to free up our military from, instead of doing security work, uh, the whole purpose is to make sure that our military doesn't have to do the security work so they can be the tip of the spear. So uh, the questions that, and now I want to tell you where I have tremendous sympathy. This company should answer every question you have. Every question. They should have immediately called you up. They should have let you know what happened. They should have said, this is what we know. What questions can we answer? They should have assigned someone to you to get, help you get information, an ombudsman in the company. And I'll tell you, the moment I was in your shoes where I got uh, pushed back, I would have, I'd, go, I'd sue them. I'd sue them. I would do anything I could to get the information. And so I, I'm just going to throw that out for your comment. I do want to say in, in sympathy to Mr. Isaac, his point is, I ask this question on occasion of witnesses. Is this your statement or is this a statement drafted by your attorney? And the reason is when an attorney drafts a statement, they are thinking of the lawsuit and, and, and uh, what information they want to make put in, in the public record. It's a very valid question. It wasn't whether, uh, I know my colleague, it wasn't whether you as women or as bereaved people could write a statement. You could write a wonderful statement. The question is, uh, as we look at it, is the committee being used properly uh, to look at this? Or are we uh, furthering a private lawsuit? So let me just say to you, is it true in fact that you asked for information immediately and you got pushback? And I'd like everybody, not just one spokesman, I'd like to ask you. Yes, sir. It is the truth. We were pushed back and not told the truth. Yes. Blackwater lied to us. Yes. Okay. Ma'am? Yes. Okay. And so the purpose, uh, it seems to me, is that once they did that, uh, you had no choice but to take action against them. That's my view. There was a, an earlier question in your statement, and it was regarding whether or not Scotty had a choice. An employee of Blackwater's went up to Scotty's room with two thugs, held him down, took his gun away from him, <coughs> told him if he did not go on that mission, he was on the streets of Baghdad that night, he would be on his own to get home, and he would pay back any monies that Blackwater had paid him. 
So, no, he didn't have a choice, did he? Let me just say that's an extraordinary important uh, statement to put on the record under oath. Just tell me how you know that to be true. The person that was in the room at that time with Scotty told me. So someone else who was there shared that information with you. What? And would you identify who that person was? I, I can't. No, 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 ma'am. Uh, also, Scotty's email stated. Ma'am, ma no, I, I need you to say, you said a person said. Who is that person? Can I say? You need to ask your attorney? No. He's not we'll, uh, know who the person was in Scotty's room. Can I answer that? Well, as I understand, first of all, your time is yeah, up. I as I understand the question, you said that there was a person who said this, who was in the room, and he sent an email to you. And you believe it. Why and I, I guess not? the real question is, even if he had not been told that information, are people assuming the risk of dying because their employers want to cut back on the payments to provide the security for their employees? Well, this is a doctrine, excuse me, I hate to the, Well, that. they took every, the few very minor things that they were guaranteed, they took every one of them away. Yeah. Had they had any one of those, they probably would be alive today. It seemed to me it was a kind of a personal, intentional thing. It was well, this, so this blatant. Is, this is, um, I understand what you're saying, and uh, I just want to, I know it's not my time. It's in, uh, okay, I can't can give the name of this person. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. If he wants it's to, I can. Point of order, Mr. Chairman, please. What is your point of order? My point of order is that I had time, you've taken it away, and now you're speaking without time. And you're speaking on something that I was pursuing and leaving in question something, uh, making a statement, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to you. It matters to me. And if I could have my time or you could have a legitimate time, we could have a dis the only thing that The matters. gentleman's point of order is well taken. We now recognize Mr. Yarmouth for his time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. I join the, the other members of the committee in offering our sympathies and our gratitude for your sacrifice and for being here. Um, I want to pursue a, a, for a second the train of thought of Mr. Shays because he tried to, to draw a distinction between what would be characterized as pr providing security and uh, other types of military activity. And this may be something you may not be able to answer, but and if so, say so. But it seems to me that a lot of what our military is being asked to do in Iraq involves security. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. So my, my point by way of a question is, to the extent that you're, you know, was the activity that your relatives were involved in distinguishable from what many of our military are doing in Iraq right now? Our active military. I don't know. I mean, was, was the different? You don't know. Okay. Well, fair. I know Scotty was told he was going to be security for Paul Brimmer, and he would be working in the green zone. He never met Paul Brimmer. He was told that by Blackwater. Yes. So essentially, to the best of your knowledge then, there really isn't a distinction between what y your relatives were doing and what our active military are doing now, many of our active military. The, the main distinction is that they were not given the equipment to do it. And they're being paid by a different right. um, employer. Um, <clears throat> immediately following the incident at Fallujah, um, there was a New York Times story. And in that New York Times story, uh, a man named Patrick Tuohy, who was a um, high-level um, executive at Blackwater, apparently, was quoted about, um, it was asked about the, the attack and was quoted as saying, the truth is we got led into, an ambu into this ambush and he then provided some details about the Iraqi Civil Defense Corps and how an escort had been arranged just east of the city and so forth. So he seemed to know a fair amount of uh, detail about the attack. Have any of you ever been contacted by Mr. Tui? Did you try to get information no. from him? No. no. We have contacted them numerous times asking those very questions and they won't return our calls. So he was apparently willing to talk to the New York Times, but yeah. not to you. S somewhere later in that article, he talked about the, um, the fact that they were planning to conduct a more thorough investigation. Did you ever get any more information about subsequent investigation that they may have? We have received no information, period. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yarmouth. Uh, Mr. Hodes? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies, thank you for coming today. And um, I want you to know uh, how sincerely we appreciate your being here and the sacrifice um, that you have made. And having some familiarity with litigation in my former life, uh, I know how tough it is to go through what you are going through with the pushback from the other side. And it takes a great deal of courage uh, to do what you're doing in pursuing answers uh, from this company. Um, we have watched over a period of years this um, intermingling uh, of contractors with forces and the use of contractors growing by the U.S. military, especially um, in Iraq. And it's clear now that the numbers of Americans who are serving in Iraq, serving their country as your loved ones did, is actually much, much higher than the numbers that the military reports because they don't talk to us mm -hmm. about the contractors even though they're providing those services that your loved ones did. So this is really a, a very important issue in the way things work together. Um, and it doesn't matter to us whether uh, uh, your loved ones were in the army or they were private contractors. They were Americans serving their country bravely. So we really understand and feel that. I want to ask you some, uh, what may be some basic questions about some information that you had or didn't have. Did your loved ones sign written contracts with Blackwater? No. There were no written no, contracts. Are you asking us personally, did we yeah. sign? Well, not you. Did, the, did, your, did your sons and, and husbands sign uh, written contracts with Blackwater? I, I believe they did. Do you have copies of those contracts? Yes. yes. OK. Um, and uh, were you aware of whether or not there were any other discussions surrounding those contracts where Blackwater made representations to uh, your loved ones about what they would have to protect themselves and what equipment they'd have? Well, your questions are long. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Chris Berman was with Scotty, and he signed the same contract, and so uh, and he joined the same time Scotty did. So they were there together, and they were friends back in California. So a lot of this information comes directly from Chris Berman. And your folks were told they would have armored vehicles, they'd have protection, they'd have machine guns, they'd have what they needed to protect themselves from risk. Correct. Were they told anything about the various levels of subcontracts between Blackwater and these other companies that we've now heard about? I, I don't know. I would doubt that would, would have transpired. Uh, sitting here today, can any of you say with any certainty what the relationships were between Blackwater and Fluor or KBR or ESS? Do you have any idea how that worked at all? Well, I understand it's a pyramid type thing, and it <laughs> usually starts with Halliburton, then it goes to KBR, then Regency, then ESS, and then Blackwater. And then Blackwater prepares their invoice adds on their 35%, goes to ESS, they prepare theirs, add on 35% on top of Blackwater's 35%, and it just goes on and on. So everybody gets a cut as it goes on up. And it just keeps growing, too, because they're adding 35% on other 35%. Do you know whether or not any of the companies, on the, as, the, as things go up, exercised any oversight over Blackwater <coughs> and how it was treating its employees? I'm not aware of any. Do you know if the Defense Department, which ultimately was at the top of this pyramid, as you called it, was monitoring what Blackwater was doing with its employees? The only de uh, defense um, paper I saw when Chris brought Scotty home and he, he gave me his personal things, there was something uh, in there with the Defense Department heading, and it basically just said that they had no liability to Blackwater. Do you think that someone should do more to watch over what's going on with the private security contractors, most, including Blackwater? Yeah, uh, most definitely. And do you have any feelings as to whether or not it ought to be the Department of Defense, which ought to be doing more to monitor what's going on with the contractors who are serving our country so bravely? Well, since Blackwater's whole defense is that they had a government contract with the Defense Department, yeah, I think the Defense Department should establish some rules. And do the rest of you agree with, yes. with that statement? 
I do. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Hodes. Uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, <coughs> thank you uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, you mentioned that there was a service at Blackwater, uh, to, uh, and that were all of you not at Blackwater? It was for your loved ones. Uh, did all of you attend that? Yes, I did, I did not. Oh no, Rhonda didn't. I, did I didn't attend. Uh, did your uh, my mother did? Your mother did. Okay, uh, and there was a reference that there were guards that each of you was separated from one another. Uh, and I'd like to ask you uh, if you could each comment on that and in your case, uh, comment on uh, how your parent was treated there. Well, I know that my mom said somebody was with her. Can you speak into the microphone so we can hear you? Somebody was with my mother, but I don't think she ever referred to them as guards, per se. She what? She never referred to them as being guards, okay. but she knew that they were always with her when they never had alone time together with the family. Was so. she... Uh, discouraged from spending time with the other families? It seemed, she seemed that way, yes, because whenever they went out to dinner, they joined, and if I, she I went somewhere in the hotel, they, were, they followed, so. Okay, and how about you? Thank you. How about you, Ms. Helvetson? The same. Um, they would uh, walk me to my door to go to bed at night, and there would be someone standing outside of that door in the morning. Uh, the last night we were all there, we wanted to go out to dinner and just talk, and uninvited, they chose to join us and a number of them, and so it was a pretty quiet dinner. Did that inhibit your conversation? Well, one night, though, after the first night we were there, after the guards left, I snuck out of the room, and we all went down to Donna's room, and we talked, so, so they, uh, they at least allowed us that. All right, uh, and Ms. Teague, you were not there. No, the uh, time that it happened was my son's birthday, um, Mike's son, he was struggling and we opted not to attend. So. How, how old is your son? He's 19 now. Right. Uh, Ms. Ofko, how about you? Um, well, what they've shared, uh, I did feel um, they were there to watch over us, to see, you know, not to communicate with the other people. Uh, for instance, uh, this one thing, they have uh, planted trees and made stone he uh, headstones for our for my son and for his co-workers or, you know, people that work for Blackwater that were killed in Iraq. And I ran out of film uh, to take a picture. I just wanted a picture of my husband with the headstone and, you know, all of that. And I was going to ask um, a lady from, um, that was there to take a picture for me so that, you know, I was going to give her my address to mail it to me. Well, before you know it, there was someone already there saying, oh, no, you don't have to do that, you know. I'll take the picture and I'll send them to you. Well, he took the pictures, but he never mailed, us, mailed the pictures to us. So okay. uh, that's there. Uh, I had my grandchildren there and my daughter-in-law. We were all there, but there was, uh, there was no ease. Um, they've told us that they didn't work for Blackwater when they waited uh, when we came in, when yeah. we flew in. In reality, when we came into the um, headquarters the following day, the same people that said that did not work for Blackwater, that their wives worked for Blackwater, had the t-shirts of Blackwater on and standing at the entrance uh, letting us well, in. Thank you. So. Yeah. Uh, just one quick question for each of you. I appreciate that. Um, you're all strong women made stronger by being together. If each of you could ha have ask a question of Blackwater to get one piece of information, what would each of you ask Blackwater to do to help you come to terms with the loss that you've suffered? The truth, the simple, plain truth. Mrs. Zabkor, Donna, this is what happened. This is how it happened. You couldn't see your son's body, but we're telling you that this is how it is. It would be good. Do you know that remains of my sons were sent to me, what, in 11 months? The first, what, in 10 days? And then the, what was left of him 11 months later? They sent his charred arm to her. Yeah. <laughs> Just the truth. Do you, I mean, basic truth. You know, we live in the best country in the whole wide world. Why can't we have the basics, what we were built on, the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. God and truth. That's Thank all. Thank you. Ms. Teague, Nothing thank you. Else. Very similar. I, I would like an account from start to finish of that day. Whether I want to hear it or see it, I, I would. 
um, every minute of it, every part of it, the truth. Thank you. Tellison. They showed such a callous disregard for life. And now they claim we have no rights, that we don't have the right to sue them. I don't know about you, but I am outraged. Where is your outrage? Thank you. Ms. Badalona. Like, every, like everybody else, I would also like the truth. And it's just a simple question of why. Why couldn't you give him the protection and the tools that he needed to, to complete his mission? Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Chairman, I yield whatever time I have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Bilbrey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me uh, thank the ladies for being here today. I think it's uh, essential to remind us that no matter how good the intentions are, um, there's always uh, in major efforts, major mistakes. And Congress bears the responsibility of not just finding fault, but trying to find answers. We can't um, relieve you of the burden that you're going to bear the rest of your life and your loved ones. But we do bear the burden of trying to modify the process to minimize the potential for this to happen again. Um, Ms. Teague, there was a lot of discussion here about the isolation of our of um, your loved ones um, from the rest of the rank and file of the employment of the group that was under Blackwater. And there were specific references to the fact of contractors going to third world countries to find, quote unquote, inexpensive employees to be able to provide the infrastructure, the support that, the, um, uh, that your loved ones needed. Um, I'll be very blunt with you. Um, do you think we should be looking at the fact that this, uh, the people that are recruited to do American jobs may need to be Americans and should be required to be U.S. citizens um, so that it's U.S. citizens side and side by side? Would you, and let me just poll you, would you suggest that we just make it a uh, matter of fact policy or consider a policy that says that when an American contractor gets an American contract to go into these type of situations, um, they must hire U.S. citizens to do the job. I think that would be very appropriate. I agree with that. That's, that's a, I agree, but I think that there's also the intel part of that, um, which again falls on other people, but you have to have intel that involves, when you're in a foreign country, people that can integrate in that. But I, I do prefer and wish they were all American, but that's a problem that has to be addressed in that. So. I, thank you very much. I appreciate that, and um, I appreciate the uh, the very balanced approach and many of you on this issue. And uh, it's astonishing that you can be so level-headed and so cool to with the the kind of experience you've you've uh, gone through. So I appreciate that. Um, this time, if the gentleman from California, time I yield to Mr. Isa. Thank. I thank the gentleman. Uh, following up a little bit on what Mr. Shays had asked about, there was a statement made. That, that there's a, uh, I think there were four names named and a 35% markup each time. Uh, how did any of you know about that or what do you know about that? I have read uh, just about every article that has come out regarding Blackwater since about six months after the incident. Jeremy Scahill has just finished a book. He has done such incredible research and he's so thorough. Jay Price has been incredible. Okay. okay, so it's from unclassified information. And if I did my arithmetic, basically your loved ones were paid about $200,000 annualized. That would mean with 35%, it'd be about $800,000 the government would pay per person per year if four contractors did 35% markup. Is that roughly your understanding from the readings you've had? I haven't done the math, but as all I know is Scotty didn't even get one paycheck. I understand, and it's, uh, would it, are, are you aware, or all of you aware that Secretary Bremer was guarded for his time in Baghdad by Blackwater? Yes. So that, yes. that's not inconsistent. I would venture to guess he had armored vehicles. 
In your reading, were you aware of all the write-ups about our military personnel, including the Marines from Camp Pendleton, who were short up-armored Humvees, and as a result were driving around with tin-sided Humvees at the time because there was a worldwide shortage of the armor capability? Yes, I was aware they would scavenge around Iraq in these junkyards trying to armor their own vehicles, which is horrible. How could our government send them over there and they become scavengers trying to protect themselves? Now, I understand that, and it's, it is regrettable, but it is documented that uh, the U.S. military had the same problem of insufficient armored vehicles uh, during that time. W are you also aware that Mr. Waxman and Speaker Pelosi and myself were guarded by Blackwater as late as 2005, 2006, on our last, or to March 2005 when we were there, that, that, that they've guarded, uh, I believe, 91 Codells, virtually every uh, congressman that went in and out were guarded by Blackwater in Iraq. I wasn't aware of that. But what does What's that have point? to do with What's them? What's the point? Sending I, my son the way they did on the job that he was doing when he died. I, I mean, I didn't come here and say the people that work for Blackwater are not qualified to guard and protect. My son was one of them. The reason that I'm here is because they did not supply to my son what he needed to do his job, what he was qualified for. So what they did, that's just fine. I hope that they keep on doing a great job. But that has nothing to do with the death of my son or preventing them from not doing it to someone else just because they're good at Green Zone and they're able to protect the people that come there, be it you or anyone else. They did not protect my son. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back as appropriate. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing today. Uh, it seems to, to me that regardless of who they are technically working for, uh, when Americans are killed in action in a war zone, uh, there should be a moral obligation to tell the family how it, it happened. Um, Mrs. Zavko, what is it that you want to know from Blackwater and what specific questions uh, would you like to get the answers to? And if, oh. if you have, have a list, send it forward. Can staff go get the list for us, please? I want to know the truth about the March 31st, 2004. I want to know about the way that they knew of this contract coming up, that Black Brother is going to have the contract. They were working on having the teams put together for the missions, and then all of a sudden, the last minute, they do what they did and send these so men well, on the mission as they did. I want to know about the contracts that Blackwater needed to fulfill with the other companies that they were subcontracting from. Why didn't they oblige? Why did they not provide what they needed to provide for these employees of theirs if these employees were going to do the job? Why did they do it three days before the day was ever to come for them to go into the effect? What was the hurry? What was the rush? And especially with not giving them what they needed to have. Why did it take so long for my son's body to come home? Why, why wasn't there someone in front of them with the heavier equipment if they were not equipped, someone that was more equipped? If our military couldn't go in, how come Blackwater could send them? Why? Why? Don't you understand? What's the truth behind it? Is it the dollar? Or what is it? Or were there really lives being saved by taking my Jerry's life? What, what is it? Tell me. I don't know. I, I don't have the answers for you. And hopefully the next panel can help shed some light on it. But it sounds like reasonable questions that deserve answers. And Blackwater should be willing to answer those, those questions. And I'm sure that the military, if these were active duty military, they would be willing to give you the answer. Let me, let me also ask you about uh, Eric Prince, who is Blackwater's CEO. Uh, he is known to be a very private man who does not often go on the record to talk about his company. Uh, but I understand that two of you have spoken with him personally. Yes. And Mrs. Zavko, Mr. Prince came to visit you at your home in Ohio after news of Jerry's death. Uh, what do you remember about that visit? 
Um, I remember being told uh, that he would be there about 8 o'clock. Uh, he came um, accompanied by our sheriff's uh, department. They escorted him to my son's house. And out of everything, my brother-in-laws and my sister-in-laws were there, my daughter-in-law and myself and my husband. All I can remember, I can still see him sitting across the table, my son's dining room table, telling me that if he thought, I thought is his words, if anyone could survive the war in Iraq, it would be Jerry. He actually told me and made me feel like he knew who my Jerry was to find out later that he was just an employee that he did not know. It, sound, it sounds as though uh, they just looked at Jerry and the other employees as, as just that, employees, just that and employee didn't realize they had a family attached to them or anything else. Just a figure, just, just someone to be able to charge the government for services rendered from people that government had educated and made of what, who and what they were. You know, but their own choices though, granted, my son went to work for Blackwater. You know, he chose to because that's how he could contribute on fighting the war in Iraq. But Blackwater did him wrong, very, very, very wrong. And it seems that this war has gone awry. It does. Uh, and, and, and people have died unnecessarily that didn't have to. All under, and in this case, all under the name of profit. Yes, all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your testimony thank and you. thank you for your insight. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I Thank you uh, for yielding back. Uh, someone asked whether this is germane for our job as members of Congress. If our military wasn't providing sufficient equipment, armored vests, basic, uh, basic uh, needs of our troops, that's germane to us, and if our subcontractors and contractors are not providing what they should be providing to our troops who they've hired uh, to represent our interests, that also is in our interest. That's also germane to what we want to know. Ms. Schakowsky, do you want to be recognized? Yes. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I really appreciate the courtesy you've extended to me as someone who's not a member of this committee but has tried to drill down over time on the issue of private military contractors. I want to say to you that I saw, I'm not sure if it was all of you on the, uh, the film Iraq for Sale, the Robert yes. Greenwald film that I wish every member of Congress would, uh, would watch about the role of pri private contractors in, in Iraq. And I really appreciate your raising the questions of accountability that you have, because that's really the, the policy, uh, the, the questions we have. But one, one policy question I, I wanted to point out to you is that why, the question of why should we hire companies like Blackwater if they're so much more expensive than the military, and Eric Prince actually answered that in a way that you may have heard. He said last year about the military, quote, so when they say, ah, we need about 100 guys to do that job, we say, actually, you only need about 10 to do that job. And I don't know if you've heard that quote before. You know, I, I, he's saying Blackwater needs only one-tenth the manpower to do the same job as the military. I wondered if you, anyone had a reaction to that. If you would compare the time they were slaughtered Blackwater had 400 employees in Iraq. By March of 2004, 20, I think almost 25 had already died. Versus the military, the total military over there, and the, the total military that have died. Now, as I say, I have not done the math, but their percentage is much higher. And if he thinks it's only worth sending 10 men out, I would pretty much guarantee those 10 men come back dead. You know, on, uh, on June 13th of last year, 06, Chairman Shays of the subcommittee you mentioned, we had a hearing. I heard, I heard that entire hearing. And, and, and at that hearing, where we had the State Department, the Department of Defense, the USAID, I asked questions about how many contractors do we have there? How much does it cost? How much are we paying? What's the total number of dead and wounded? You know, 
your loved ones are not considered when the number they, they don't count no they don't they're, they're, so they're not they don't even count we think that it's upwards of about 800 but we can't get that that answer i asked to see a blackwater contract at that time we wanted to know if any laws had been broken in the host country U.S. laws, international laws, if disciplinary actions had been taken against any contractors. No one had an answer. That was in June. In December of 2006, the um, Government Accountability Office said there's little visibility over these contracts. We don't know. So I just want you to know, today I, I introduced a piece of legislation, the Iraq and Afghanistan Contractor Sunshine Act, to answer those questions, we need to know, are your loved ones being asked to do jobs that are inherently governmental functions and given what any soldier, what any military, U.S. military uniform person would be, would be given? We need answers to these questions that you've been asking as responsible members of, yes. of yes. Congress. And, and so I, I really want to thank you because you put a face on this veil of secrecy of these troops that are there or these, these personnel that are there carrying on these missions for our country. And we don't know a darn thing about them. And when they die, we don't even report their deaths. We don't answer them. I don't know if you want to respond to that. Just but I thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for that acknowledgement because that is why we are here today. That thank is why, and I appreciate so much because my next question was after this hearing, what happens next? What I do you do with the information? To this legislation, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Friendly, I just like to, if the gentlelady would yield. Yes, I'd I yield. just like to say I think it is a great summary of the value of your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, and I, for one, would like to be put on your legislation. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Thank you for yielding. Thank you, sir. Before we uh, have you leave and hear from the next poll, Mr. Shays did ask a question. And I saw you leaning back. I, I guess that's your lawyer. But I think he should get an answer, and we all ought to get the answer to the question. Who was in the room with your son? It was Chris Berman. Chris Berman. Chris Berman was the youngest Navy SEAL ever until Scotty came along. And they did these workout camps and workout videos together. And uh, Scotty usurped him. And th that record will hold forever. So they had this fun rivalry. So they went over together, uh, and they had been friends prior to that. Mr. Shays, did that, you want that, anything that, else to No, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate you uh, moving forward with that. And it's helpful for us to know, and I okay. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, I, I, uh, I think it's important when we ask questions of witnesses, uh, we get answers, <clears throat> complete answers. And I appreciate that you gave us Chris Berman answer. now is in Kuwait City building armored vehicles. He finished his two-month contract with Blackwater, then left, came home, built this, the most heavily plated armored vehicle over there, and he can't build them fast enough. So Chris is making a difference. Thank you. Well, I think your testimony will make a difference as well, and I thank you very much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, you're, 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 you can leave. We're going we're gonna to now hear from the next panel. And in this next panel, we'll receive uh, testimony from first, uh, we want to welcome Tina Ballard, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Procurement for the United States Army. We also welcome Andrew Howell, General Counsel for Blackwater USA. Every day, I'm so cry every day, I miss you so much. Thank you so much, but keep it up, don't stop now. Okay. Thank you. We want to welcome Andrew Howell, General Counsel for Blackwater USA, Steve Murray, the Director of Contracting for ESS Support Services Worldwide, George Siegel, the Director of Security for the Government and Infrastructure Division of KBR, and Tom Flores, the Senior Director for Corporate Security at the Fleur Corporation. Thank you. Oh. Yes. 
I want to uh, welcome our witnesses. We would appreciate it if uh, we could have some order in the room so we can hear people on our second panel. It's our policy to um, swear in all the witnesses that appear before our committee. So I'd like to ask our witnesses to um, please rise. Okay. We're missing one of the witnesses. Who, who are we missing? Ms. Ballard? What's that? Why, don't you, why don't you sit for a minute? We'll, we'll do you all at once. I'll stand again because that's our practice to swear in all the witnesses. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, the record will indicate that each of the witnesses uh, answered in the affirmative. We have your prepared statements, which will be part of the record in their entirety. Uh, we'd like to ask each of the witnesses to give a summary of that testimony and try to keep within the five minutes that uh, we allot. You may submit a longer written statement, and the committee will include that statement in the official hearing record. Uh, Ms. Ballard, why don't we start with you? There's a button on the base of the mic and pull it close to you. And uh, we'll go down uh, in the list and uh, have questions after each witness has uh, testified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to again report to you on the U.S. Army contracts for reconstruction and troop support activities in Iraq. It is my privilege to represent U.S. Army leadership as well as the dedicated military and civilian members of the contracting workforce who have been at the forefront in Iraq. Our work and our success to date would be impossible without the tremendous support the Army receives from you, the members of this committee. We thank you for your wisdom, your advice, and your guidance. The Army contracting workforce has two very different, important missions in Iraq, to support reconstruction contracting and to provide support for the troops. The mission is also one of constant change. Over time, 
The reconstruction has moved from large design build contracts to firm fixed price contracts with Iraqi firms in an effort to reduce security cost and to provide economic opportunity to the Iraqi people. The log cap contract for troop support is also changing as we move away from one contractor as currently exists under log cap 3 to multiple contractors under log cap 4. Regardless of the contract vehicle, however, one thing has and will remain constant over time. Our commitment to ensuring that all contractors comply with the terms and conditions of their contracts. There is no flexibility or negotiation or compromise in this commitment. The last time I testified before this committee, I was asked about a letter from the Secretary of the Army dated July 14, 2006. The letter from the Secretary was sent in response to allegations that there was a subcontractual relationship between Kellogg Brown and Root Services Incorporated, ESS Worldwide Services, Regency Hotel and Hospital Company, and Blackwater Security Services. The Secretary's letter stated that based on information provided by KBRS to the U.S. Army, KBRS had never directly hired a private security contractor in support of the execution of a statement of work under any Log Cap 3 task order. Additionally, the letter stated, KBR has queried ESS and they are unaware of any services under the Log Cap contract that were provided by Blackwater USA. I was asked if this letter was accurate. I responded that Secretary Harvey's letter was correct. I also committed to looking into this matter and I have kept that commitment. As a result of extensive research, the U.S. Army correspondence with ESS and KBRS, ESS recently confirmed to KBRS and the Army that they obtained security services. ESS built and operated dining facilities both as a direct contractor to the U.S. government and as a subcontractor to KBRS and other companies. On January 30, 2007, we learned that ESS engaged Blackwater, the Regency Hotel, and that ESS employed private security primarily to protect its employees and management traveling in Iraq and to transport currency to pay vendors and employees. Based on information we received from KBRS, we understand that these security costs, which were not itemized in the contracts or invoices, were factored into ESS labor cost under its DFAC service contracts with KBRS under Log Cap 3. The U.S. Army is continuing to investigate this matter, and we are committed to providing full disclosure of the results of our investigations to the committee. If KBRS violated the terms and conditions of the Log Cap 3 contract and knowingly or unknowingly incurred cost for private security subcontractors under the Log Cap 3, the U.S. Army will take appropriate steps under the contract terms to recoup any funds paid for those services. The last time I testified before this committee, I also listed a few reconstruction accomplishments of the Defense Department implementing agencies. Today, I can add to that list. Twelve hospitals serving over 6,000 patients a day have been refurbished. Water treatment capacity now serves an estimated 2.2 million Iraqis. Electrical generation projects have added 1,420 megawatts to the power grid. Crude oil production has increased through extenuating circumstances. We have kept production though, I'm sorry, though extenuating circumstances have kept production from reaching full production. And 839 schools providing classrooms of over 350,000 students have been constructed or rehabilitated. So in conclusion, we are proud of the dedication, commitment, and hard work of our contracting workforce in supporting our troops and rebuilding Iraq. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ballard. Uh, Mr. Murray. <coughs> Chairman Waxman, Representative Davis, members of the committee. I am Steve Murray, the Director of Contracting for ESS Support Services Worldwide. I served over 20 years in the United States Army, retiring as a Chief Warrant Officer. During my service, my mission often was to deliver food services and other logistics support to our troops. I carried out a similar mission as an employee of ESS. ESS has extensive experience building and operating food service facilities in remote and challenging locations such as mining camps and offshore and oil and gas drilling platforms 
in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. ASS provides a range of support services to its customers, including full food services, supply logistics management, transportation, vehicle maintenance, facilities management, and communications. I joined ESS in June 2003 to oversee its contracting for operations in Kuwait and Iraq. In December 2002, ESS began to build and operate dining facilities known as DFACs to feed the American and other coalition troops that were arriving in Kuwait at bases such as Camp Commando and Camp Coyote. Every day, ESS served thousands of our soldiers and Marines for, for, for full-service, high-quality meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a midnight meal. After coalition forces moved into Iraq in March 2003, ESS followed our troops making sure that they were soon eating hot meals instead of MREs. From 2003 to 2006, ES built and operated defects at over a dozen sites in Iraq, including Baghdad, Fallujah, and Tikrit, as well as performing camp construction at Camp Taji and in Basra. ESS also provided food services and facilities management to the Coalition Provisional Authority, as well as food services for civilians performing reconstruction work in Iraq. ESS performed many of its services in Iraq as a subcontractor to KBR. We also delivered on numerous contracts directly for the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Department of State. All of the subcontracts that ESS entered with KBR were competitively awarded and were performed by ESS on a firm fixed price basis. Instead of being a cost reimbursable or cost plus contract, ESS's contracts with KBR stated a bottom line or a maximum not to exceed price for the services that ESS was contracted to provide. Except in unusual circumstances, if our costs were higher than anticipated, that was our problem. We had, a firm, we had agreed to a fixed price. One of ESS's costs that was higher than we had anticipated for was for private security. Beginning in the middle of 2003, ES security conditions in Iraq compelled ESS to hire private security firms to move its personnel and supplies among defects. Without the aid of private security firms, ESS could not have performed its mission of feeding the troops. ESS moved most of its supplies through sporadically, through sporadic military escorted convoys, and supplies often took days or even weeks to reach the defects, or simply never arrived at all. When necessary, ESS called on private security firms to provide well-trained, armed personnel who escorted supply trucks and ensured that food services to the troops were not disrupted. Many other contractors did the same. ESS also used private security firms to escort our managers and staff as they drove to and from defects and other sites. I traveled between sites with our private security providers on many occasions. The military escorted convoy system was intended to move supplies, not people. We had over 100 ESS managers and over 1,000 ESS staff getting the job done at more than a dozen sites in Iraq. We, would not, we could not have fed the troops if we could not get our people to and from the defects. We were determined to never compromise the safety of our personnel when they traveled between sites. ESS used a number of different private security firms between 2003 and 2006, including Blackwater. We always made it clear to KBR and other parties that co contracted with, with ESS that we were using private security firms. I am proud of the work that I have performed for ESS and my country during my time in Iraq. I'm glad to be here today to help this committee sort out the facts for the American people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Howe. <clears throat> Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, members of the committee, 
My name is Andrew Howe, and I'm General Counsel of Blackwater USA, dedicated security professionals whose primary mission is to protect the lives of Americans in very dangerous places. More specifically, Blackwater professionals, most of whom are military veterans, voluntarily go in harm's way at the request, direction, and control of the United States government. Chances are, if and when you as members of Congress and your staffs travel into Iraq, your lives will be protected for at least part of the trip by Blackwater. Areas of Iraq are among the most dangerous places on earth where violence against Americans is endemic. Our people choose to put their lives on the line daily in the service of our country. On behalf of Blackwater, I thank them for their service, especially those wounded or killed in the line of duty. I express again our deepest condolences to the families of our fallen colleagues, both those who appeared here today and those who did not. Losing our teammates is the hardest reality of our profession. Just two weeks ago, we lost five good men who were shot down in Iraq protecting a diplomatic convoy. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families. The U.S. Ambassador to Iraq said of the incident, these five American citizens were our colleagues and worked on behalf of the United States government. They represent the best of America, showing valor and courage in the work they did each day. The State Department noted that these men played a critical role in our effort to bring a better way of life to the people of a country who had never experienced freedom and opportunity. We will always remember their courage, commitment, and ultimate sacrifice for their country. Like the other good men we have lost in the line of duty, these men are heroes who embody the best of who we are and who we strive to be. Our professionals serving today in Iraq are part of our nation's total force. Just last month, before the Senate Armed Services Committee, Lieutenant General Petraeus, the new commander in Iraq, said he counts contract security forces among the assets available to him to deal with the enemy insurgency. To be clear, we do not engage in offensive operations, but our defensive security function helps to unburden more of those in uniform to do so. With regard to the important policy issues we will discuss here today, we look forward to working with Congress so that the right laws, policies, and procedures are in place to ensure that private security contractors can support our nation's essential security missions. I hope you will understand that there are matters that I cannot discuss in an open forum such as this, especially matters relating to operational security or matters that our government has classified. I will endeavor to answer your questions as fully as possible with these restrictions in mind. However, my task is even more complicated. Our company comes before this committee today facing a lawsuit. As you know, committee staff provided us with a copy of a December 13th letter from plaintiff's counsel to Speaker Pelosi, pardon me, Speaker Pelosi, effectively requesting that Congress hold this hearing. I respectfully request careful consideration of the impact of asking in an open oversight hearing questions that were requested by one party in ongoing litigation. Our hope is that this hearing will not delve into an incomplete and one-sided exploration of a specific battlefield incident, but rather will explore the important policy issue of whether death and disability benefits of contractors and service members should remain roughly the same as current congressional policy dictates. At Blackwater, we are proud to serve the United States. Our professionals are highly skilled and experienced. Yet for all of the experience and training, no one can guarantee that they will be safe when they step into a war zone. Our enemy has ensured that. Although our teammates have bled and even died in our mission of protecting other Americans, we have never lost a protectee. And our support for and dedication to our nation remains strong. I am prepared to answer whatever questions I can under these unfortunate circumstances. Thank you very much, Mr. Howell. Mr. Siegel. Thank you. Chairman Waxman and members of the committee, my name is George Siegel. I am the Director of Security for KBR's Government and Infrastructure Division. From October 2003 to May 2006, I was the Director of Security for KBR's Middle East Operations. In that role, I oversaw all of security measures for 150 project locations and more than 50,000 employees and subcontractors. 
I was in, in Iraq an average of once a week for the 32 months I was in that job. Let me say, my heart goes out to the families of all of those who have lost their lives in brutal attacks in Iraq. My own friends and colleagues, both members of the military and civilian contractors, have been killed in support of operations in the region. We know how difficult the situation on the ground is and that the, the situation the troops face is very, very tough challenge. We are proud to provide food, housing, and other necessities to them. We support U.S. and coalition troops at 55 sites in Iraq, 70 other sites in the region. Since 2003, we have served more than 490 million meals, transported more than 675 million gallons of fuel, delivered more than 220 million pounds of mail, washed more than 30 million bundles of laundry, and hosted more than 80 million visits to morale, welfare, and recreation facilities. Whether building mess halls, providing food service, or setting up housing, our goal is to provide the soldiers with the basic necessities, a hot meal, clean clothes, when they're back on base, returning from dangerous missions. The feedback we have received from the troops on the ground has been overwhelmingly positive, and we are proud of the work of our courageous employees. Like me, many of my KBR colleagues served in the armed forces. We understand the importance of our work to support the brave men and women of our military. I followed my father into the Marines, and I'm proud to say that my son followed me and also joined the Corps. I served for 26 years, and my career culminated with nearly three and a half years as a White House liaison officer for the unit that includes Marine One, securely transporting both Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. The focus of today's hearing is the use of private security contractors. To my knowledge, every foreign company working in Iraq uses private security in one capacity or another. KBR uses private security on our non-log cap work. And in certain circumstances, our log cap subcontractors did as well. Military security was not guaranteed for all of the work the company did in the region. And traveling without security is exceptionally dangerous. Since 2003, there have been approximately 400 injuries and fatalities to KBR employees and subcontractors due to hostile acts. Those injuries and fatalities were due to improvised explosive devices, mortar and rocket attacks, small arms fire, and kidnapping. At Christmas time in 2004, a suicide bomber blew himself up during lunchtime in a KBR run dining facility, killing 13 troops, four of our employees, and three subcontractors. To date, we have lost 98 people in Iraq, Kuwait, and Afghanistan. According to this morning's news reports, overall more than 770 civilian workers have been killed in Iraq and more than 7,000 injured. These are the realities our employees and subcontractors face every day. Amid such dangerous conditions, KBR operates a fleet of trucks that transports military fuel, military parts, medicine, hospital supplies, food and mail to coalition troops. They have logged more than 100 million miles with more than 700 trucks on the road on any given day. Our mission has required us to be extremely flexible. In 2003, KBR was initially directed by the Army to plan to support between 25,000 and 50,000 troops. The scope and nature of our task changed dramatically. This is not a criticism. Ever-changing priorities are a reality of war. And the reality was that our mission grew to supporting more than 185,000 troops. This dramatic change in the scope of services presented significant challenges. KBR first faced difficulties in mounting such a large enterprise in a hostile environment. As with any endeavor of this size and magnitude, there have been times when our company and those that we work with have made mistakes. A handful of our 50,000 individuals on the ground have acted improperly. When we had questions about the actions of certain individuals, we investigated and reported them to the Army. The rapid growth of our assignment and constant changes taxed our systems, but we adapted and developed systems that work. In conclusion, for more than 60 years, KBR has undertaken demanding assignments in dangerous regions to support the U.S. military. I speak for everyone in our company when I say we are extremely proud to support the courageous men and women of our armed forces. With each meal we serve, we try to bring them some small sense of the comforts of home. And when a soldier does have a few extra hours, the fitness centers we run and the activities we host at our morale, welfare, and recreation facilities offer a brief refuge from the strain of combat. 
As the Congress continues its oversight of the war effort and contracting, I want to assure you that we are fully committed to cooperating with the Congress as it fulfills its oversight responsibilities. As a government contractor, we take very seriously our responsibility to assist in the proper oversight of our work. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I look forward to your questions and will do my best to provide you with the information you need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Siegel. Mr. Flores, the there's a button on the base of the mic. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tom Flores. I'm the Senior Director of Corporate Security for Floor Corporation. After a nearly 25-year career in the United States Army, I joined Floor in 1998 and have since been responsible for floor security programs around the world. In 2003, I was assigned to oversee floor security programs in Iraq. Floor began working in Iraq under a contract with the United States Army Corps of Engineers through which we provided services throughout the entire U.S. Army Central Command region, including Iraq. Subsequently, Floor and its joint venture partner, AMEC, a UK-based engineering and construction company, also competitively bid on and were awarded three of the reconstruction contracts. These contracts covered water programs in the north and south of Iraq and restoration of electricity. In the course of executing that work, Floor had no contractual arrangement with Blackwater USA and Regency Hotel and Hospital Company for security or other services a fact acknowledged by Blackwater in a letter provided to the committee. With respect to ESS, Floor and Floor AMEC contracted with ESS at three separate locations in Iraq. In two locations, ESS provided dining and or camp <coughs> facilities to Floor and Floor AMEC. Those locations were Baghdad's international zone where ESS provided dining facilities for employees working on our two water contracts, and Burzagan Power Station in southern Iraq, where ESS provided camp services. In a third location at Camp Cook at Al Taji, under a subcontract two floor, ESS provided planning, field engineering, procurement, transportation, construction, and rapid setup of housing and latrine units. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee and I stand ready to answer your question about Floor's work in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Schwatkin. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Alan Schwatkin, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Counsel for the Professional Services Council. The Professional Services Council is the leading national trade association representing more than 200 companies of all sizes that provide professional and technical services to the federal government. Many of our member companies are operating in Iraq under contracts awarded by the departments and agencies of the federal government. These firms are purchasers of security services, and we've worked with them to highlight and address their concerns. Uh, several of our member companies provide security services in Iraq, in the United States, and around the globe. Uh, some also have contracts directly with the United States government, and we're working with them on a myriad of issues as well. We share the outrage at some of the events taking place in Iraq. However, we must be realistic about the circumstances in which the events are taking place and the options that may be available to address them. We share the outrage at the unfortunate loss of life in Iraq. Thousands of, thousands of American troops have been killed in the line of duty and many thousand more wounded. U.S. contractor employees have also been killed while performing their work, with several thousand more wounded. And we offer our condolences and prayers for their recovery. Yet we must be realistic about the missions that they are asked to perform and the risks that all who are working in that hazardous environment take on a daily basis. Iraq is a unique foreign policy event in our nation's experience. To our knowledge, it is the first time that the U.S. government has attempted three simultaneous activities, a military action, a massive reconstruction effort across ten sectors, and extensive developmental assistance effort. There was an initial massive surge of resources into Iraq often in uncoordinated and overlapping activities that led good people with good intentions to make their best judgments under trying circumstances in the middle of a war zone. While we share the outrage about the dollars spent in Iraq for the results achieved to date, we must also be realistic about the reasons for those dollars spent and the results achieved. In the contracting environment, for example, the U.S. government made a conscious decision to be a good steward of the contracts awarded and applied the full scope of the federal acquisition regulations to the preponderance of the contracts awarded there. The U.S. government made a decision 
to impose U.S. health and safety requirements on its contractors. The U.S. government made a decision to require its contractors operating in Iraq to have liability insurance. Each of these steps in isolation may have been the right decision for the right reason, and we don't have any objection to the government imposing them in a planned and consistent manner. But imposing these additional contractual requirements increases the cost of contract performance. So every dollar awarded by an agency or spent by a contractor in performance of these contractual requirements is not waste and is not abuse as those terms have been commonly used. We share the outrage about the appearance of a lack of accountability for certain behaviors in Iraq and strongly endorse holding all participants in the contracting process equally accountable for their responsibilities. We strongly support a robust oversight function, and where fraud is found, we strongly support vigorous prosecution. But we must be realistic about the activities that are taking place and the root cause for them. Companies don't set the mission. The nature of the contracting arrangements in Iraq, particularly at the earliest stages of the war, was driven exclusively by the government's choice and the government's requirements. So while it is legitimate to talk about the appropriate roles and assignments for contractors, the use of code words for their work masks the real issues and diminishes the opportunities for serious discussion. Contractors are playing critical roles in each of the concurrent operational areas taking place in Iraq today. It would be impossible to execute the number and scope of projects underway without them. We share the outrage about the cost of security, but we must be realistic about the factors that are driving such behaviors. For those contracts awarded by the Defense Department to directly support the military's activities, the contractors that accompany the force, uh, for them force protection and other life cycle support functions have traditionally been the responsibility of the military. We strongly support that formulation. But in a significant and little discussed June 16, 2006 change to the Defense Department's acquisition regulations, the Defense Department has made force protection the primary responsibility of the contractors performing unless the military accepts the responsibility directly in the contract. We strongly oppose that reversal of policy, but our companies are adjusting to it, including addressing the cost of performance to reflect these changes. For contractors who are supporting the reconstruction activities or are under contract to other federal agencies, force protection has traditionally been the responsibility of the contractor performing that work, and we support that. A July 18, 2006 proposed acquisition regulation has reconfirmed the U.S. government policy to impose this responsibility and the expense on contractors. So while we can be outraged about the security instability in Iraq and the cost of security spent by contractors to support their activities, we must be pragmatic about understanding the cost uh, that are driving such cost. In conclusion, hiring private security is common in overseas operations. Iraq is not new in that regard. However, the magnitude of the work and the concurrent operations taking place there create unique challenges we see. The security situation is highly volatile and contributes to the unique challenges. But any solution must be addressed carefully with full consultation to address the real issues without creating new problems. Professional Services Council would welcome the opportunity to work with this committee and others on these important matters. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this information. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, I want to thank each of you for your uh, testimony. Before we proceed to questions, there was a um, motion by Mr. Issa to take down the words of the gentlelady from Illinois, and I want to recognize Mr. Issa on this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it was unfortunate that I was out of the room when the words were spoken. Uh, after reviewing the words, uh, which I'll, I'll read uh, just to be sure we all understand them, uh, I also wanted to take exception to the question about who wrote the testimony, because I think clearly the implication was that somehow these wonderful women couldn't have possibly written that wonderful, heartfelt testimony, and that it took a lawyer in order to put, to, put it together. And I resent that very much, and I just wanted to put that in the record. Mr. Chairman, although these words I think are inappropriate and they set the wrong tone, for the business that we must do as a, on a bipartisan basis. After reviewing them and after believing that this was an anomaly in this committee and not something uh, that would be regularly repeated, I'd like to withdraw my motion and I uh, appreciate the time. I yield back. 
I, I appreciate that. The uh, gentleman has uh, withdrawn his motion, and uh, uh, therefore there's nothing pending before us. I was going to read the words, but the gentleman did accurately read the, read the words in question. Well, let me start with uh, my questions. And without objection, uh, the chair and the ranking member will have 10 minutes each, and all members will get uh, um, five minutes to pursue the matters. Could uh, one of you figure that out? Okay. Uh, Mr. Howell, let me start with you. I, and I want to begin by extending my thanks for you to be here. We heard very emotional testimony from people who lost their loved ones who work for your company. Their, their pain is very personal, but there's pain for your company as well when you, any of your employees lose their lives, and I want to acknowledge that fact that you pointed that out in your testimony. And I think I'm speaking for all the members of the committee that we're sorry for your losses. Thank you, sir. At a, at a company providing security services, you have a job to do, and as members of Congress, um, we have a job to do. Our, our job is to provide oversight to make sure government is working effectively and efficiently and to identify and eliminate any waste in taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we've heard allegations that call into question the job that Blackwater was performing in Iraq. The family members raised questions, I think legitimate questions that deserve answers about whether Blackwater is endangering the lives by skimping on protective equipment. That was the issue raised. Uh, the contracts and audits we've received have raised questions about whether Blackwater is over, overcharging and double billing the government. I don't know what's true or not. I, I haven't reached any conclusions on these allegations, but they are important allegations and I think they should be fully investigated. I want to focus on an email you provided to us. It's an email from Tom Powell, who we understand was operations manager for Blackwater in Baghdad. It's dated March 30th, 2004, uh, one day before the attack in Fallujah that killed the four Blackwater contractors. And in hindsight, it's a pretty chilling communication. The email begins, and I quote, ground truth. Guys, this is reality, end quote. Uh, the email was sent to Brian Berry. I understand he's a senior Blackwater executive. My understanding is he is the director of Blackwater Security uh, Consulting. Am I correct that Mr. Berry was the director of Blackwater Security Consulting? My understanding is that uh, he was not director at that time, but he was uh, certainly a Blackwater official. Okay. Another recipient of the email was Mike Rush. Can you tell us what position he had at that time? I believe that he was the director at that time. He was the de director of operations for Blackwater? Uh, he was the director of Blackwater Security, is my understanding, yes, sir. The third recipient of the email was named Justin, and we presume this is a reference to Justin McQuown, McCohen, uh, who was the program manager in charge of Blackwater's contract with ESS and Regency. Is this right? I, I believe that's correct. And if I could, Chairman, those names have all been made public. Mm -hmm. But uh, to the extent that uh, our personnel uh, publishing the names of uh, Blackwater personnel that are not public information could uh, possibly place them at risk. I would ask that uh, if we could find a way to identify them without uh, publicly stating their names or perhaps go into closed session, uh, I'm certain that they would appreciate uh, that, okay. that respect for their I appreciate, safety. I appreciate what you're saying. Yes, sir. Uh, this uh, is a disturbing email because if it's correct, if it's accurate, it shows that Blackwater personnel working on the contract with Regency and ESS, which is the contract involved in the Fallujah incident, did not have adequate equipment or vehicles. And it also shows that Blackwater may have been circulating situation reports that were, I, I quote, smoke and mirror show, and not, quote, reality-based information, end quote. Let me uh, read you a passage from the email. Quote, I need new vehicles. I need new comms, which means communications devices. I need ammo. I need Glocks and M4s, uh, which are types of weapons. All the client body armor you got, guys are in the field with borrowed stuff and in harm's way. I've requested hard cars 
from the beginning and from my understanding an order is still pending. Why, why I ask? It is my understanding that someone in Kuwait made a decision to go with suburbans that are used. Bad idea, end quote. Uh, the email ends, quote, ground truth is appalling, end quote. Well, my understanding is that this email was addressing the lack of equipment available for Blackwater personnel working on the Regency and ESS contract, which is the current contract involved in the uh, Fallujah incident. Is that correct? It was, if you'd like me to come on, comment on specific uh, text from the email, I'd like to have it in front of me, sir, but the, the general subject of the email okay. was overall equipment requirements. Okay, we'll, we'll be glad to give that to you. But the, the question I have sort of prelim preliminarily is whether uh, uh, the email was addressing the lack of equipment available for Blackwater personnel working on the Regency and ESS contract, which is the contract involved in Fallujah. It, it was discussing a lack of equipment as to the contract as a whole. It, it, it doesn't follow therefrom that uh, any individual who, who set out to accomplish a task didn't have the, the equipment that he needed. Okay. Um, Mr. Howell, have you investigated the circumstances surrounding the Fallujah incident? Uh, I, I am familiar with them, yes, sir. Have you determined whether the conditions described in the email are accurate as it relates to that incident? Were, were your forces sent on missions and used suburbans rather than hardened vehicles as the email describes? Yes, our forces did go on missions, uh, some of which were in soft-skinned vehicles, but the, the nature of what we were doing there is that it was not a single task, it was not a single mission that our men did, so different equipment was appropriate for different missions, uh, given the threat, as it was known, at the time on the ground in Iraq. Were your forces short on communications devices as the email uh, describes? There was not sufficient uh, communication gear for the team on the day of this memo had it been fully manned. However, there was sufficient communication gear for the teams uh, that would have been operational at this time. You, you uh, answered my question about um, the um, Suburbans, as opposed to hardened vehicles, uh, and you said general, on certain missions that was the case. On the mission in Fallujah that uh, we heard about this morning, was it the case for that incident? I'm not following your question, sir. Was it the case that a the four, suburban was appropriate? Uh, no. Did they use a suburban as opposed to a hardened vehicle? Uh, they used something equivalent to a suburban, which, which was a, a Mitsubishi uh, Pajero. It's, it's the equivalent in the U.S. of a, a Montero. And the idea behind using that vehicle is that it was a, a uh, sort of a local vehicle that uh, was a low key uh, approach. It, it sort of blended in, if you will. Uh, was it hardened? Uh, it had been outfitted with uh, some steel plate. Yes, sir. And on the issue of communication devices, uh, which the email described in this particular Fallujah incident, uh, did they lack communication devices? Uh, they, they did not. Uh, if, if we are going to inquire into specific facts that are under litigation, um, I, I would uh, propose that we do so uh, not in an open uh, session. But I, I can't answer that question. Yes, sir. You, you cannot I, answer? I can't answer the question. Okay. Well, I'd like you to answer the question. Yes, sir. The, the men that day did have communication devices. They did. Okay. Uh, were they short on ammunition and weapons, as the email describes? The, the email describes the situation for the project as a whole. The men who went on the mission on March 31st uh, each had their weapons and they had sufficient ammunition. Um, Mr. Murray, you work for ESS, which is the contractor that hired Regency, which is the contractor that hired Blackwater. I'd like to ask you about this email. Uh, at one point in the email chain, Lorenz Badenhorst receives a copy of Mr. Powell's email. Mr. Badenhorst is an executive director at ESS, as I understand it. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Uh, and you might want to pass the mic. 
this. Mike as well. The microphone over. Uh, Chairman Waxman, yes. Lawrence Bodenhorst uh, at the time was our uh, CEO of our design and build division. Okay. And uh, Mr. Murray, what information does your company, ESS, have about the conditions described in Mr. Powell's email? Chairman, I'd like to first uh, say that ESS's relationship was with Regency. Uh, we had contracted with Regency to provide ESS with our private security as a turnkey, turnkey service. What I mean by turnkey is we relied on Regency to tell ESS what equipment, what routes and such were safe for us to move throughout Iraq. Um, and we relied on them exclusively. And in our contracts with Regency, we, we gave them the ultimate authority for go or no go scenario. So if they determined it was unsafe, they had the ability to do that. And, and we identified them for that fact. Um, but one of your executives received this email. What, um, do you have any information that corroborates the complaints about lack of equipment and vehicles that Mr. Powell describes? No, I don't, Chairman. Okay. Um, perhaps the most disturbing parts of the email involve what Mr. Powell had to say about the situation reports that were being prepared by Justin McGowan of Blackwater and Regency. And let me read you some excerpts of this part of the email. The sit reps by Regency slash RHHC, I'm reading, are very misleading and bogus on the surface. My only hope is that Justin sees through the smoke and mirror show and believes me when I'm telling him that all is not what it seems. Justin knows what has to be, what has to forward and realizes that it is just enough to sustain the appearance of gear and an operational capacity. Please, Justin, send your sit reps to the client with reality-based information. Mr. Howell, have you investigated the situation reports that Mr. McGowan was preparing? No, sir. Do you agree with the description in the email that they were smoke and mirrors and not reality-based? Not having seen them, I, I can't comment one way or the other, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Murray, uh, do you have any, any information about um, whether ESS believes it was getting accurate information from Blackwater and Regency about the ground truth? Chairman, ESS had, had confidence in Regency to provide us with accurate intelligence, accurate movement guidance. Uh, so the answer is yes. We relied on Regency to provide that to us. Uh, we also have a response from Mike Rush, who's Deputy Director of Operations for Blackwater. It's dated March 30, the day before the fatal attacks. And uh, as I read it, Mr. Rush is telling Mr. Powell that the problems he has identified are not Blackwater's responsibility to fix. Let me read you some excerpts of what Mr. Rush told Mr. Powell, the author of the Ground Truth email. You are right about vehicles and comms being the responsibility of RHHS, which of course stands for Regency Hotel and Hospitality. There is no order for hard cars. The contract only allows for hardening. And yes, I realize that is not optimum. Body armor for the clients is not our responsibility either. It is in fact up to RHHS, Regency, to fix some of the things you mentioned, particularly reliable vehicles. Mr. Howe, the email from Mr. Rush reads to me like someone is passing the buck. Do you agree? I, I don't agree, Mr. Chairman. And the reason is Mr. Rush is just correctly noting that it was uh, under our contract with Regency, it was the responsibility of uh, Regency to uh, fund the acquisition of that equipment. Uh, it does not mean that uh, Blackwater was not actively seeking to assist in identifying and obtaining uh, the required uh, equipment as, as the other emails uh, would indicate. Well, there are three issues and questions whether the vehicles were uh, hardened sufficiently to protect them, whether they had the ammunition, the, uh, the, the uh, ammunition and equipment needed to protect themselves. And thirdly, the question also is um, um, wh whether they had a third person to be a tail gunner. Do you, can you tell us whether they had what they needed in all three of those areas? Yes, sir. 
Uh, with regards to the armored vehicle question, uh, there was uh, certainly desire to have some sort of uh, armored vehicles uh, on this project, meaning the ESS project as a whole. But uh, again, it doesn't follow there from that each mission involved uh, an armored vehicle. And in fact, a uh, re close review of the contracts uh, reveal that it was specifically contemplated mm -hmm. that th there would be uh, other vehicles which had had uh, some sort of protection added that, that would be used on the project. Uh, beyond that, uh, the, the armored vehicle question, uh, w the, the vehicle that they went out in that day was uh, believed appropriate uh, based on the mission uh, by everyone involved or the mission. Uh, I, I don't believe that it would have uh, been carried out at that point. Um, and the armored vehicle uh, whether they whether it would have affected the events of that day is another question uh, with regard to the third person uh, the uh, Protocol for the type of mission the men were on that day and, and again, we're we're bordering on things that uh, could place uh, Could involve operational security of not only our folks, but service members uh, the the mission they were on that day at that point in time, given the threat it was, as it was known on the ground in Iraq, uh, the, the norm was uh, not to, to have the third person. Okay. Well, Mr. Powell, obviously, in his email, was expressing concern. I guess my general question is when Blackwater sends private forces into a war zone, do you have an obligation to equip them adequately? And I assume you would have to say yes. Then my next question is, did Blackwater meet this obligation in Fallujah? Yes, we did. Okay. And I just want to conclude by reading this quote again. But guys are in this field with borrowed stuff and in harm's way with the client to which I'm very uncomfortable with given the upcoming events with five million Shia moving in Karbala in five days. I've requested hard cars from the beginning and from my understanding an order is still pending. Why I ask. Thank you, um, um, Mr. Davis. Um, thank you. Ms. Bowder, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you note that the Army will take steps to recoup funds paid under log cap for private security contractors. But as I understand the law, uh, these security services were likely performed under a fixed price subcontract. As far as you know, has the Army ever been able to recoup funds in a situation like this where the costs appear to have been embedded within a fixed price subcontract? As far as I know, they have not. Okay. H how would you be able to do that if it was competitively bid? In a competitive fixed price contract, we don't have access to the subcontractor's data. Um, the regulation prohibits us from getting cost and pricing data in a fixed price competitive contract from the prime, and also prohibits the sub prime from getting that data from the subcontractor. Does the Army have enough personnel on the ground to support military convoys uh, for log cap sub subcontractors? Do you know the answer to that? I don't have the answer to that, sir. The majority says that the cost of security services provided by private firms are substantially higher uh, than the uh, direct costs that would be incurred by the military. Do you have any comment on that? No, sir, I don't. The GAO and SIGER have uh, estimated that our security costs on the ground are between 9.8 and 12.55 percent. Now, we hear a lot about the so-called evils of tiering. Uh, now, as I understand, the practice is of using a number of levels of subcontractors to perform various functions under a prime contract, which is larger and has myriad features of which one company may not be able to deliver all of those services. Um, I guess the alternative would be to just have more direct contracts, which would entail uh, much higher aggregate costs uh, to the Army in terms of overseeing it. But do you think the practice is, in general, wasteful and inefficient as it's portrayed? Uh, in a, a, So the practice of having um, subcontract tiers is a practice, according to our research, that even occurs in commercial construction in the United States. Of so from your perspective, there's no reason to outlaw it. anything. It's obviously oversight is in important to make sure that they're subcontracting appropriately and there's competition. Is that fair to say? We don't have anything in the regulation that allows us to prohibit subcontract tiers. And in fact, if a prime contractor didn't have the in-house capability to perform that, they would have to subcontract it, or the alternative would be to have a myriad of additional contracts directly with the government, 
where the government would, in a sense, be the integrator. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Howe, we've heard that the cost of security services provided by firms such as yours are much substantially higher than the direct costs that would be incurred uh, by the military. Do you have any comment on that? You're not the decision maker here, but you're on the ground delivering and, and just. I, I'm not, uh, not qualified to comment on the, the costs, the direct costs of uh, military services. Well, let me ask you this. Like you noted that 99 percent of your contracts in Iraq are fixed price contracts. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The vast majority are, are of a firm fixed price nature. Okay. Uh, and if I may clarify, sure. sir, in, in some contracts there are uh, mandatory provisions for pass-through of costs, but there is no uh, markup or profit on those costs. It's the, the, the general nature of those contracts is a very limited number of specific items are passed through at cost. How many of your contracts were awarded under competitive acquisitions? Um, of our contracts in Iraq, and, and again, I understand that the uh, the nature of today's hearing is only on unclassified contracts. I'm not prepared to, 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 I don't know the answer regarding any classified work at the moment, but in terms of unclassified work uh, of approximately, uh, uh, out of our, all our contracts in Iraq, one, uh, to my knowledge, was, uh, was not competitively bid and it was issued on an urgent and compelling basis after the incumbent was, uh, was unable to provide the services and we were asked at short notice to provide those services. Okay. But that's not the contract that's been at issue today? That, that's not the contract at issue and, and ultimately that's, that's not uh, the, a contractor decision, that's, that's a government Correct. decision. Correct. Yes, sir. Um, we've heard that your people are paid anywhere from $600 to $1,500 a day for these dangerous assignments. I wonder if you could give us, explain the various payment structures you have with your employees. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, the, I think there's a great deal of myth about uh, the exorbitant pay rates. I mean, certainly our people face grave danger, but, uh, and they are well, that's well recognized. Um, but in terms of the rate structure, which is, is your real question, uh, the, the general nature of these sorts of government contracts for security services involve uh, breaking it down into classes. They're typically called tiers. And at a given tier, there are very specific requirements by the government client on the, the experience level and uh, capabilities of the individual. And the, the individual's services are billed out at a firm fixed price per day based on uh, which tier uh, they lie in. So for example, uh, a special service veteran uh, I'm sorry, a special forces veteran with uh, extensive experiences built at a much different rate than someone who just had uh, more uh, general military experience and less time. Um, what kind of markup do you get over the direct costs on a basis? Does that also vary with the tier? Well, uh, the nature of our contracts is a, a fixed price basis. Correct. So. Um, and it's competitively bid, so and I'm it's, not... It's competitively bid, yes, sir. So it's, our pricing is really based on it's, it's the market price. pricing, not cost. Um, so but I'm just curious. Okay, uh, it's, well, it's, I, I don't want to be unresponsive, sir, but it's a question that's it's sort of mixing apples and oranges. Uh, cost contracts involve markups over cost. I, Fixed I, I price. understand the business. Basically, you yes, don't want to give away your cost data. I'm, I'm Basically, you don't want to give away. You're, you don't. You're not yes, compelled right. to give it away. You don't want if, to give it if, away. Right. It would. Uh, it would harm competition uh, on future future contracts. Well, I guess. I mean, it's a, obviously it's a it's a question. Even though these are fixed price, it is of interest to us. But but I'm not going to put yes, sir, push you at this point. What death benefits do you provide to, to the survivors uh, when an enemy kills a contract employee? Well. All government contractors are mandated uh, by statute uh, to provide benefits under the Defense Base Act, uh, and um, they, that's essentially it's a program that was set up. It goes back actually to World War II, uh, and it was set up in order to provide uh, a, what is in effect a workers' compensation uh, benefit for those who are injured or uh, 
uh, killed in the service of their country, contractors overseas working for the government. Now you don't do anything in addition to that, is that uh, correct? Well, we are always looking for additional ways to protect our folks. Uh, we uh, currently have uh, an additional insurance policy that's above and beyond that that uh, we, we acquire because we want to provide for our folks. In the contracted issue for you heard from the first panel, who was Blackwater's clients? Were you contracting with Regency or ESS? Our, our contract was with Regency. It was with Regency. And uh, I, I've, I've seen some tiers that have been introduced in some charts and the like. And who was Regency contracting with above that? My understanding is that Regency's contract was with ESS. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of um, attention to the cost of providing security services. And let me just ask in a general question who wants to take it. Why, why are these costs, these costs seem to be very, very large over there. Uh, so you, obviously there's a huge premium whenever you're doing this kind of thing. Can somebody explain to me what goes into your marketing of this as a, and your costing of this, your pricing? How do, how do you price a security provision into a contract? Is it, is it a marketplace based or is it your costs or? being able to uh, recruit people to go over? Uh, what, what goes into that? Well, these are competitively bid contracts. So it's, yes, it is ultimately driven by the marketplace. Uh, there is high competition for the, the individuals, security professionals with the expertise that's needed. Uh, we have to, have to uh, account for that as well as the many expenses that we incur in uh, training them, often providing weeks of training at Moyoc, transportation uh, on many contracts. There's uh, lodging, subsistence, travel to and from Iraq. Uh, the, the, the list of factors that go into it vary with each, each contract. Is it, is it hard to find people that are willing to do this? Uh, qualified people. It, it's, it is always a challenge to find the most qualified people, yes, sir. Mr. Murray, let me ask you. The military convoy system for log cap uh, contractors has been described to us as unreliable. Um, could you address some of the choices your companies face with when the military convoy system doesn't work uh, as it should? Yes, I can. Uh, we face many challenges. Uh, moving our cargo, it's actually two aspects. We move cargo and we move people. Uh, I, I uh, mentioned in my statement that the convoy system wasn't designed to move people. We had over in excess of a thousand ESS employees in the country of Iraq. Uh, primarily we had to move them from Kuwait into Iraq and it was a challenge to move them into Iraq into a coalition camp, either a KBR site or another site, safely. Uh, the convoy system itself, the rules to put our non-tactical vehicles, they're called NTVs, non-tactical vehicles. Those are the vehicles that would carry our civilian employees into a convoy would change virtually on a daily basis. Some days we'd be allowed to put a non-tactical vehicle in a convoy. Some days we'd arrive with one or two of these vehicles uh, and we'd be told at that point, well, the, the rules have changed. We, we can't accept your vehicles today. How'd that impact us? Uh, that that prevented us from moving our chefs, our cooks, our, our laborers up to the site. That was one impact to us. That, that caused or could have caused delays in our performance. Another impact, another extenuating circumstance perhaps, is the border crossing between Kuwait and Iraq called NAVSTAR uh, was an assembly point for all the contractors that crossed our vehicles into, a, into Iraq. We would ship at the peak in excess of 300 to 350 trucks per week. Convoys in the early days would take five to 10, perhaps 20 of these trucks. We'd be queued up or lined up at the border um, three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning in hopes of getting in a convoy. And it may take two to three days to have all our trucks slotted into that convoy. That again caused further delays to us. Uh, let me ask you this, the, uh, on, the, on the contracted issue that you heard the first panel uh, where, where the individuals lost their lives, was that a, a, were you contracting at that point with KBR under log cap or with floor? For the particular 
contract that issue. We, we engaged, actually I can answer by saying both. We, we employed private security. You ask about the contracted issue, which is the ESS Regency contract for private security. We use that private security detachment team, the private security, to move our people throughout Iraq across all contracts. Now the specific incident on March 31st, if you'd like me to address that. That's what I okay. want to okay. address. Now that particular incident. Because we've been having a hard time figuring out, okay. I think, up here. Okay. On March 31st, that particular incident was a movement of uh, ESS cargo. We had a convoy that was moving from Taji, Camp Taji, which was going to Al-Assad. Al-Assad was on the far side of Fallujah, the western side of Fallujah. We were picking up cargo, and that, that was a KBR site. And we were going to return that cargo, supplies, and construction equipment to Camp Taji, where we were building, had a construction contract with Fleur. The attack occurred en route from Taji through Fallujah to Al-Assad. They never reached their destination, uh, but they were moving cargo into our floor contract. So it was so intermingled at this point. I, I, let me just ask then one question, Mr. Flores, from, from you. Were you aware that Blackwater was apparently performing security services for ESS as well? No, sir, I was not. You were not. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to just, uh, you know, these accounts that we've heard about with Blackwater and, and private security contractors are, are very troubling. And I'm concerned about the, the profit motive they have and the lack of uh, insight. Some reports have estimated that there are as many as 50,000 private security contractors in Iraq right now. But I have yet to see the data from the Defense Department. Ms. Ballard, how many private security contractors are there in Iraq right now? You know, the President uh, just asked us in the State of the Union, and I've heard some discussion here. The President has said dur during the State of the Union that um, he wanted more civilians, but I think he was talking about volunteers. But I'm just curious, uh, how many, how many uh, security contractors do we have? Congressman, I can take that question for the record. I don't have that number. The security contractors on the ground aren't all for the Department of Defense. There are contractors on the ground providing security for other agencies as well. So I'd have to take that question for the record. I don't have it for DOD or the total number. We'll hold the rep record open to receive that information. How long will it take? Can we get that within a week? I can go back and request the information be provided in a week, Mr. Chairman. Okay. On a larger uh, question, I really appreciate that, Ms. Ballard. Why does the why does the administration rely on so many private contractors? Do you know? And and, and we can't even count them. You know, it, and I I take it from the testimony here, um, the American people end up one way or another paying for them, and. Uh, I'm sure we all would want to know how many we have, and I know you're going to get that information for me, but why do we have to do that? We've got the President asking for another 21,500 troops. Uh, there's debate as to whether it's that number or more. And I guess what we're trying to do here, too, is just try to get to the bottom line of exactly uh, who's over there in Iraq, what they're doing, and how much are the American people paying for them to do whatever they do, and are they doing the things that are lawfully, that they, they, they can do lawfully? Mr. Cummings, you had asked a question about the number of contractors, and Ms. Ballard said she has to check because other agencies, but you should know for the Department of Defense. Do you have that information for us? No, sir, I do not. Okay. The, um, how soon can you get that to us? The question on how many security contractors in the Department of Defense, uh -huh. we've taken that for the record, and as the Chairman requested, I will go back and ask if we can provide it in a week. And can you, would you also get us the number of subcontractors, too? I will ask for that information, sir. And can you find out for us how much, uh, if, as best you can, the citizens of the United States of America are paying for these contractors and subcontractors. So as we, so as we uh, try to assess 
um, how we vote on more money for Iraq so we can, you know, just have the, the total picture. Will you do that for us? I will certainly ask and take that as a question for the record, sir. All right. Um, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cummings, uh, it just strikes me as amazing that this kind of information wouldn't be readily available. That is the purpose of this hearing, the Department of Defense. I can understand you might not know other agencies, but you certainly should know what's going on in the Department of Defense. We did invite you to come and talk about this topic. Did you not think you'd be asked, Ms. Ballard? Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the invitation to come and speak on this topic. However, in the case of the KBR contract, there were no provisions allowing security. So in our estimation, there should not have been any security provided. Well, no, the in question that Mr. The that wasn't the question that uh, Mr. Cummings had asked. Mr. Cummings wants to know how many contractors and subcontractors that. we have out there under the Defense Department, how many under other departments. He asked it generally, and you said, well, I have to check those other departments, but you'd also have to check it for the Defense Department. I can't speak for the Defense Department, sir, because I work for the Department of the Army. And in the case of well, the Well, tell us about the Department of the Army. How many do you have? In the case of the Department of the Army, we have the design-build contracts where the contractors were required to provide their own security. Those costs would be subcontracted. So we would have to go back and ask those prime contractors to provide that information because we do not have privity of contract with the subcontractors. How many contractors do you have with the Department of the Army that are in involved in Iraq? Sir, I did not come prepared to answer that question. Okay. I will take it for well, the Well, we, we will hope that you get that information to us and break it down. Uh, thank you. Uh, we now go to um, uh, Ms. Fox. I do. Um, uh, you mentioned that um, um, that there's a prohibition on the contractors having security. That's in the contract. Does that apply to other groups? And if there is that prohibition, then how do you all expect people to provide security for the people there if there's a prohibition? There is a specific clause in the log cap contract that address addresses security. That clause stipulates that the theater commander will provide uh, force protection commensurate with that provided to the service and agency civilians unless otherwise uh, stipulated in a task order. On the design build contracts, which are different from the log cap contracts, the contractors were expected to provide their own security. So there are different contract vehicles and different terms and conditions. Ms. Fox, uh, Ms. Fox if I may, uh, uh, Ms. Ballard makes an important point, and I wanted to reiterate a point I made in my testimony. There are three simultaneous actions taking place. There's a military action, and for the military action, the military is supposed to provide force protection for its contractors. But for everybody else that's operating in Iraq, and that is the reconstruction contractors, those supporting the Department of Justice, USAID, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Health and Human Services, all of those contractors are required to provide their own security. And that's why the difficulty of understanding, that's why you have a lot of security f operations in Iraq unrelated to the military activity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to follow up with a question, but I want to make a comment about the, the direction in which this hearing has gone. I, I've been here from the beginning. I've read a lot of the material. And, and I am, uh, again, a person who's very much opposed to waste, fraud, and abuse. And I, I like to think in systems issues. And it seems to me that if we're interested in waste, fraud, and abuse, and we want to do something about it, what we should be doing is being focused on the way the systems operate in all these areas. And what we've got here is a gotcha situation, it seems to me. We are, it's a, there's a tragic loss of life that's occurred, and I, every life that's been lost in any of our wars, I am sorry for what's been happening in Iraq and the war on terror, I'm very, very sorry for, and the people who were working for uh, Blackwater, I'm, I'm extremely sorry they lost their lives. But particularly in Iraq, everybody is going there <coughs> as a volunteer, and I understand that. But what we ought to be about is asking for how the systems work, 
what's wrong with the systems now and how do we get at it instead of spending all this time trying to get people on issues that are irrelevant to much of what we should be concerned about. So I want to ask one question and I'll, I'll ask you to answer with it a yes or no. Has anybody associated with the Congress or with any of the departments that you work with asked you in any formal way or any organized way to give suggestions on how we can make these systems better? Because it seems to me that's what our focus ought to be. So real simple answer, yes or no. And if you answer yes, then I, I'll ask you to follow up with that with some information. But I won't burden us with a lot of time. So um, I will start down here. Has anybody, anybody in your group looking at this, and has anybody asked you that question? Yes, ma'am. It's up to you. All right. Whatever All right. You well, then, do. how Your time. do you want to um, let Let's go down the line, and then we'll come back to whoever says yes. And we have consistently. No, they've not. Ms. Howell. Yes, they have. Okay. No, ma'am. Would you rephrase that question, please, Congresswoman? As it. Anyone in a position of authority, and I'm not going to try to name departments and that sort of thing, ask you to make suggestions on how the systems within which you're working, uh, how could they be made better so that we cut down on waste, fraud, and abuse, and certainly cut down on the potential for loss of life? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And let's go back up here and see. Can, can you tell us briefly, have those suggestions been taken? Are they still in the mill? Um, tell me just a little bit about that without going into too great detail. Yes, ma'am. Several of the suggestions have been taken. As a result, over the years, we have evolved significantly in our contracting operations in the theater. And the Army has also made a significant change in the structure. We have established the contingency contracting officer battalions that are under the Army Field Support Brigades. And this will enable our contracting officers to interface with the combatant commanders in the planning stages for contingency operations. So we've made several significant changes. Uh, let me follow up one real quickly. Has anybody from the Congress ask you for any suggestions before today? No, ma'am. No. Okay. Would each one of you respond to that part as you go down the line? Let's see. Who else said yes? I'm sorry. Who else said yes? Mr. Allen. Yes, Congresswoman. On hearing you restate that question, I, I, I can't say definitively that we've been asked. I, I would say we've had, we've discussed that issue uh, with one of our largest clients, uh, and, and it's it's been more in the nature of. Uh, us and the client seeking to to provide the best protection possible for the folks that we're protecting, and to to agree on uh, the, to uh, our, our billing is closely scrutinized, and we make sure we're in agreement that, uh, that the the bills are correct. But no one from Congress has asked you that question before today. No, ma'am. Hey. Uh, no one from Congress has asked me uh, anything about this, but <clears throat> a gentleman named uh, Lawrence. Well, before Pete you get into details, because uh, the time has expired, but you basically want to know if anybody in the Congress has asked, and your answer is no. Anybody have an answer in the affirmative that anybody in the Congress has asked you? Yes, Mr. Trump. The, the yes to for us. Uh, we we worked uh, closely with the House Armed Services Committee in uh, 2005. The development the oversight uh, work that they were doing, the development of some legislation, uh, similar work with the Senate, uh, and also, of course, this committee in the past years. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fox. I, I, I do want to point out that now is the time Congress should be asking these questions. We should have been asking them in the past. And asking questions and trying to get accountability is not gotcha. It's trying to do our job. And I think we need to work together on a bipartisan basis to do that. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Howell, I'm going to ask you some questions. Would you do me the favor of turning up your, your uh, microphone towards you so that I can hear you better when you respond? Thank you. 
you in your comments, I think, inferred the fact that you thought that the um, gentlemen that went into Fallujah and lost their lives were um, outfitted and situated in such a way as, um, as were warranted by the general conditions at that time. Uh, I want to ask you if you are aware uh, of an agreement for security services dated March, uh, March 8th, I believe, uh, of 2004 between ESS and Regency. I draw your attention to the appendix A of that document. The second paragraph reads, further the Regency's analysis of ESS requirements and the current threat in the Iraqi theater of operations as evidenced by the recent incidents against civilian entities in Fallujah, Aramadi, al tajij and al hala There are areas in Iraq that will require a minimum of three security personnel per vehicle. The current and foreseeable future threat will remain consistent and dangerous. Therefore, to provide tactically sound and fully mission capable protective security details, the minimum team size is six operators with a minimum of two armed vehicles to support ESS movements. Were you aware of those contract provisions, sir? Yes, I was. Okay. Now, does that change your testimony earlier that you thought having two people per vehicle uh, with plated vehicles as opposed to armored vehicles was sufficient on the date in question? It does not. And there are a number of reasons why. First of all, uh, this agreement uh, is, as you said, it was executed March 8th between ESS and Regency. <laughs> on March 11th, uh, during a meeting between uh, Regency, ESS, and Blackwater, uh, my understanding is uh, ESS confirmed that, uh, that uh, armored vehicles were not uh, appropriate or not expected, not requested for all missions. Okay, so you, what you're saying is they told you verbally something that absolutely contradicts this statement here, that ESS had requirements that for the current and foreseeable future threat will remain consistent and dangerous in recommending a minimum of six operators and a minimum of two armored vehicles. So three days after this contract was executed, you say they said exactly the opposite thing. Th this contract was between Regency and ESS. That's correct. Three days after that, uh, I, my understanding is ESS uh, stated that uh, that was not required and the requirement imposed by Regency on Blackwater uh, was that there was not a requirement for armored vehicles. Do you agree or disagree with the threat assessment as stated in that paragraph? The, <laughs> that statement in the paragraph it just reflects the fact that it was a dynamic and dangerous environment in Iraq. It is not a statement uh, as to the specific conditions in any particular place on any given day. Well, it, it talks about civilian entities, Fallujah, Aramadi, al Taji, al Hala. those are fairly specific places. Talks about a consistent and dangerous threat remaining for the current and foreseeable future. And it talks about the type of capabilities they think are necessary to deal with those, a minimum team of six operators and a minimum of two armored vehicles. Do you agree or disagree with that assessment? I, I disagree with part of that, sir. It, it notes specific incidents uh, to, to reinforce the general point that Iraq was a dangerous place. And with regard to the uh, armor requirement that's uh, discussed in Appendix A of the Regency ESS contract, my understanding is that that's with regard to personal protective services, which is a different mission than uh, convoy operations. Mr. Murray, do you uh, agree or disagree with that threat assessment in that paragraph? I'd like to make a couple of points, if I may. No, uh, I really just wanted your answer. I've got a limited time, okay. and so that'd be yes or no would be sufficient. Thank yes, you. Yes, I would agree with that. Thank you, you do. And Mr. Howell, let me say this. I'm aware that you asserted earlier that Mr. Powell's email may have been speaking generally about conditions. But are you aware that that email was written at 1 a.m. Uh, on the morning of March 30th, which is, in fact, the morning of the day in which the gentlemen were sent out on their mission? Are you aware of that date? Uh, yes, sir, I'm aware of that. Okay. And are you aware that Mr. Powell is, in fact, the one that directed those men on that mission? He was their direct supervisor that day? Yes, sir. And you still think that that was only generally that he was not contemplating those men in those conditions specifically on the morning when he wrote that? I, I can't. No, I can't read his mind, sir, but right. uh, given what I know, the status of the program, the, the problems, uh, the, the, I would say the challenges faced by the program were the same challenges faced by everyone in Iraq, which was acquiring enough equipment 
but the fact that there, the question of whether there was enough equipment for the program had it been fully manned that day is a, is a very different question from whether the team was equipped. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Tierney, um, Mr. Shazu, and Mr. Issa. Oh, Mr. Ken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hell, uh, when did Blackwater enter its first government contract? I believe that was in 1998. And that, I, I think uh, we have contracts for training in the U.S. and contracts for security services overseas, and those are two different animals. And uh, that was under the Clinton administration then? Yes, sir. Not. And do you uh, have staff or contracts with people who have been uh, employed by the Clinton administration? I'm sorry, in I didn't political follow your capacity. Question, sir. I didn't follow uh, for instance, uh, you're, you're accompanied by counsel today. Uh, do you know what her, uh, what is her name and is, is, what was her uh, political experience? Yes, sir. Her name is Ms. Beth Nolan, and she was indeed part of the Clinton administration, to my understanding. And do you know what her uh, title was there? I'm sorry, sir. I don't recall it at the moment. Um, but that's, that's fine. I guess my point is that you're not exactly what you would call a Republican company, then, are you? No, sir. We have uh, folks in our company of, uh, of many persuasions. And, um, and therefore, it would follow that you're not an extremely Republican company. And at this point, I would like Mr. Uh, Chairman to introduce or ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a letter from uh, Callahan and Blaine dated December 13, 2006, uh, to the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, uh, wherein um, the uh, let this, me uh, inform the gentleman that that letter is already part of the okay. record. Thank you. Then let's referring to that letter that's part of the record. Um, these these uh, the lawyers who or the lawyer who drafted that letter referred to you as an extremely Republican um, company, and uh, went on to demand uh, that uh, this committee uh, proceed to investigate issues. Uh, presumably to help them with their discovery. Um, they also accuse you of being of profiteering uh, from the war in Iraq. Uh, but your company existed before the war in Iraq came into being, did it not? Yes, sir. And are you, in fact, profiteering from that war? Uh, have you skimped on equipment? We have not skimped on equipment, no, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, let me just say here, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you know, I, I personally don't think it's, a, it's wrong for committees to investigate issues where there is litigation. In fact, I think that's appropriate on occasion. But I think it is highly inappropriate uh, to have the perception that this committee or any organ of Congress is used to beat up a company uh, to discover information that, that lawyers can't uh, discover in the ordinary course of, of litigation and that the purpose of this committee uh, should be, in fact, to find out what's wrong and then help fix those things that are wrong. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely clear that things have not gone perfectly well in Iraq. Uh, but uh, to victimize any particular company, especially when that company is undergoing litigation uh, uh, under tragic circumstances, is, uh, is, is I think, just uh, something we need to be very careful. Now, I'm, of course, this committee is not at fault for a letter written by a law firm, but I would hope that the committee would be extraordinarily careful uh, to not be the instrument of a law firm like that. And Mr. Hal, you, you had uh, five employees that were tragically killed uh, recently. Would you like to, to talk a little bit about the circumstances, what they were doing that day, and uh, what was behind uh, uh, the decision? Are, are there things you would like to, statements you'd like to make so that we can understand that a little better? Um, yes, sir. I would. I would very much like to discuss that, uh, but I, I am unable to do so in an open hearing. B because what they're doing was was classified. And the fact is, much of your work is very, very difficult, driven by sensitive information, by confident, by uh, 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 information that can't be made known. Uh, Thank you. I, I appreciate your being here and your undergoing these questions. Uh, a war is difficult, especially when it's as expensive and complex and with so many issues at hand as, as we have in this, in this war. And uh, uh, I want to just let you know I appreciate your being here and yield back the balance of my time.
I thank the gentleman for his questions. I do want to state to you that I strongly agree with that statement that it's not appropriate for committees to be uh, getting information for private law lawsuits. I re resented it when I saw it uh, take place when uh, the Republicans were in charge of the Congress. That's the last thing this committee should be doing. But we need to ask questions, even if a lawsuit is pending. And as I heard uh, from the family members this morning, there are uh, there is a lot of information yep. that I think uh, we're entitled to know. And I've been working on this particular investigation for a couple of years. Yep. It's about time we got all the information out. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I think, and I agree with the gentleman, but I think that part of the problem is that we got this perception because uh, Vice President Cheney's connections with Halliburton just put a flavor of, uh, I don't know, complicity there. Uh, you know, a political one, appropriate or not, it's there, so we just have to address it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, would the gentleman yield? Is the gentleman suggesting that uh, complicity is, is a term that means that the Vice President Connection. is involved Connection. with illegal dealings? I don't think that, they, that anybody in this hearing Con has been Connection accused. Connection is what? Well, but a connection to illegal activity? I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, is the gentleman suggesting improper illegal activity on the part of the vice president? I'm sorry. No, I'm saying that there's that the perception of a connection between uh, Republican efforts and, and some of the, uh, the industrial complex, the military industrial complex, is, is because of that perception. He's a former CEO. And so I think that that flavor is just, is just out there. And it's something well, it's we certainly it's something, if the gentleman would yield, it's something we ought to look at. I agree with that. my time. Complicity uh, is Mr. Howell, word. can I just say that uh, I just want to follow up on Mr. Tierney's uh, question. He, show, he referred to a document that indicated that uh, between ESS and Regency, there was a requirement that a minimum of three security personnel be added to each vehicle. It also refers to uh, two armored vehicles uh, to support ESS movements. Now. Based on your earlier response, you were saying that between March 8th, the date that this document was executed, in, in, in fairly rigorous detail, saying that the, uh, the current and foreseeable future threat will remain consistent and dangerous on March 8th, you, you're, I want to clarify something. You're saying that this document was changed after the 8th? I'm not certain whether a subsequent uh, contract was ever executed, executed between ESS and Regency or not, sir? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But you were saying that that was not the case on the 11th. You referred to a, another meeting on the 11th. If, if, I'm just asking, if you have documents that, that change this contract that we were, we were given, then I, I just ask you to produce it. That's all. So my understanding is that the minutes of the meeting that, uh, that I mentioned have been produced to the committee. Uh, I don't know if a subsequent written agreement between Regency okay. and ESS exists. All right. I do want to refer to, uh, there was one audit that was actually produced. We asked for all audits, but there was one audit that was produced regarding uh, the provision of uh, security personnel. And uh, in this audit, it indicates that uh, there were duplication of labor costs and connections with, uh, with personnel hired by, by Blackwater. Uh, what it essentially says here is that uh, you were double billing. You were putting uh, three, fo uh, three people, including the driver, in, in some of these vehicles. And then you were try charging uh, the government for a driver and three security people because a security person was driving. You get what I'm saying? Uh, they're saying that here there was, uh, there were costs $1.25 million for drivers at $750 a day, but those costs were already included in the security contract, and they're saying that it is, in effect, a duplication of labor costs, and consequently they question the costs, including in, in Blackwater's proposed dedicated overhead in total. And uh, what they say further on is that Blackwater applied profit to profit. In other words, you applied your uh, percentage of, of profit to profit that had already been accumulated. Uh, and lastly, they indicate in this, in this audit that the proposed profit by 
by Blackwater represented 23%, 23.6% of total proposed costs, which is, which is significantly higher than what we've seen uh, for, for similar contracts in dealing with, with the Department of Defense, uh, which is usually 1% to 5% profit margin, maybe 10% at the most. And uh, I, I just want to, 23.6% 20, profit on this, I just want to know, uh, you think that's reasonable? Is that, is that customary for the way you do business? Uh, first, with regard to production, uh, I would just like to, to note that we're, we're a small business and we've been seeking to produce as much as possible and in connection with the committee staff, uh, an agreement was reached to focus on the, the hearing today. We produced uh, close to 7,000 documents and we are continuing to produce documents. I don't know which of our audits uh, you are referring to, so I, there's some speculation inherent here. But this is the State Department contract. Okay. Uh, um, I came here to prepare to talk about ESS, but what I, what I can say about that audit that I know as of today is that uh, when that report was issued, uh, it was not a final report. Uh, there were subsequent uh, review of documents uh, by the auditors and by our uh, financial team, and when, when uh, all of the concerns had been fully in investigated, uh, the, most of those, uh, those concerns uh, were, were determined to be uh, based on misunderstandings. And the, the well, I, I understand my, my time has expired. I just want to say that the last time we had a hearing, we were told that there was no contract between Blackwater and Regency and, and ESS. And that was confirmed by, by the Department of the Army, I believe. And now, and now we come up, we come here today, and uh, we find out all that was wrong, and that there were indeed contracts uh, between between the parties. So it's getting a little frustrated, uh, not getting uh, straight information. I can tell you that. I, I don't know what we're going to hear at the next hearing. It may it may delete everything that we've we've heard here today. Sir, we are seeking to, to answer your questions today as best we can, and from what I know of the prior hearing, I, I do not believe that, uh, that the question of whether there was a contract between Blackwater and Regency was, was questioned. There was, there was a contract, and I believe that was the understanding during the hearing. I can't answer for the other, uh, the other companies that would have been in the chain. Okay. I yield back. I thank the chairman. Uh, you know, I, I, I apologize if I don't ask enough questions to quite everyone on the panel, but this appears to be mostly about Blackwater, so I'll, I'll focus my questions somewhat on then. Uh, Mr. Howell, uh, I know that there's a lot of proprietary information, but I hope that you can at least answer a couple of questions related specifically to this contract. One, have you been paid on this contract? Uh, none of the invoices that we submitted to Regency were ever paid. There was a, an initial mobilization payment, but it was uh, a small portion, a relatively small portion of the overall work that we did. And how much have you spent on this contract, if you can tell us? Uh, I believe it was uh, approximately $2.3 million. That, that's a, so if you get paid someday, you'll... If, if we had been paid, uh, I believe it would have been, the total billings were uh, $2,290,000 and some dollars. And earlier there was a statement about a 35% upcharge uh, contractor fee, if you will, that gets marked up, not just at your level, but at each level. Uh, to the extent you can without re re you know, revealing classified information or confidential proprietary information, is 35 percent anywhere close to an accurate number? If we had been paid, uh, and I can discuss this because it's a contract that's closed, the, the market has changed significantly and it, it doesn't affect our government bids going forward. The, uh, had we been paid, uh, our profit would have been significantly less than that. Uh, I, I have a pie chart that would show exactly where the, uh, the, pay, the, the payments to us that we didn't receive would have gone, and, and our profits were approximately 
They, they were slightly over, they would have been slightly over 1%. So if you got paid, it would have been slightly over 1%. If they pay you today without interest, you're in, in the hole for the amount, cost of the interest. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the allegations that in a strange way had nothing to do with the previous panel. And, and you were in the audience for the previous panel, I suspect. Yes, sir, I was. Okay. The previous panel seemed to say unequivocally that the four men who died in March of 2004 were highly qualified, highly skilled professionals uh, that you induced, offered $200,000 roughly a year to come there because of their security expertise, their training, their SEAL training, and so on. But then they alleged that, in fact, you hire people from Africa for a few hundred dollars a month. Can you tell us how, you know, because they referred to it, but they didn't have firsthand knowledge, tell us about how that would work and what they would be used for if you do it. Yes, sir. It goes back to uh, the issue of there being multiple tiers of security professionals. Some may be, they, they, it may be required that they are cleared in terms of security clearance, special forces veterans with a, a required number of years, uh, all the way down to where uh, the requirement may simply be for a third country national who has been, who has received training in, in firearms and security procedures and things like that. The level of training and the category within which a given individual will fit is specified by the customer. In terms of U.S. government contracts, it's normally specified uh, by tier, how many people by tier by the customer. So we are directed uh, effectively to uh, use some folks who are uh, third country nationals. Uh, that being said, they are cleared and vetted uh, by the U.S. government and uh, they have met the minimum re uh, required training standards. Okay, so if you were using third party, and, and I guess we'll kind of call them second or third tier compared to these four men that we uh, met with today, or their widows and, and parents and so on, uh, you pay them less? Does the government pay you less for them? Uh, sir, I, they, uh, I believe the category would be fifth tier and uh, fifth tier personnel, third country nationals, they are paid. Uh, uh, a different wage commensurate with the skills that they bring so, to the project and the so government accordingly. Just reca recapping, lower skills, lower expectation because of home wages, and lower cost to the government. Lower cost to the government, and they're also used for fundamentally different tasks. Would these third party, uh, third country nationals, would they tend to be, you know, selected because they were Muslim, because they could speak Arabic, because they had sensitivity? and or because they were not Iraqis and as a result would be less likely to align with insurgent groups? It's a combined question, but I think it, you get the gist. Yes, sir. Um, I, I think it's very much driven by the contract. Uh, um, and we do use some third country nationals uh, to provide interpretation, uh, interpreting services. Um, it, it, it's a, that's a very complex question. It's difficult to answer briefly, sir. Okay, I think the chair hopefully can follow up further. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to follow this uh, whole tier billing system and uh, so we can get a clearer picture of um, what this is costing the American taxpayer. Uh, we have some slides that we want to show to illustrate this. Um, as we've all heard many times before, in the initial level, uh, the first le we have we have four tiers of contractors, the individual contractor, Blackwater, Regency, ESS, and then KBR, and finally the, the Army above that. Uh, so six tiers altogether. And we know from the first, um, all the original testimony that the individual contractor is being paid in these, well, the one case we heard about earlier, $600 per day. And then in the next slide will show that um, Blackwater billed $815 for that same $600 employee or contractor, which represents a 36% markup. And then Regency billed ESS $1,100 for that same contractor. And Mr. Murray, ESS was paying uh, $1,100 for the same contractor who originally was being paid $600 
are supposed to be paid $600 a day. And that figure does not include housing, food costs, those types of support services. Is that correct? Congressman, that, the 1100 you're referring to mm -hmm. does not include, uh, excuse me, does not include accommodations, which would include food. Uh, it does not include fuel, as a, one of the items mentions, it's mm -hmm. cost reimbursable as fuel. Uh, it did not include the DBA insurance. That was a cost reimbursable item itself. That 1100 you see there refers to just the, just the, this, the I think that's a T, T3 perhaps, a security person himself. Personnel. So you had, essentially you paid $285 more to Blackwater than they paid for, um, paid the contractor. What does that $285 represent? Uh, Congressman, Where I was no, the value added for that $285? I had no visibility on the pricing between Regency and Blackwater. Uh, mm -hmm. Our contract was, was clearly with Regency for security services, and that was the quoted rate that we obtained. Now, their rates with their subcontractor, Blackwater, I have no visibility of. Okay. Um, now, do you, know, do you know what percent of um, your contract with KBR was comp comprised labor costs? Pardon me, Congressman? What percent of, of your contract with KBR is, uh, comprises labor costs, the cost of personnel, of the total? Okay, uh, approximately, and we, we uh, provided a detailed letter to KBR on this, approximately 45 percent. 45 percent, and do you know what percent of your labor costs are on security? Approximately 12.5%. 12.5%. 12 so you're talking about probably somewhere around 5% of the total cost would have been represented on private security contracts. That's that approximately right. Be right. Um, does that have an impact on the price you can quote for the to a um, potential contractor? Congressman, our, our prices are, as we mentioned, fixed price, firm fixed price. Uh, during the time that this scenario developed, we had already, were already involved in our contracting with all of our clients. This actually came in midterm in our clients. Right. So we'd already budgeted our, our security costs. What I'm budget. saying is that an element that, that is a, uh, an important element in your bidding, the construction of your bids and the co your competition for, for bids, the, the security costs? Is it an important element? Yes, yes, it's a very important mm -hmm. element. Have, do you know that um, has ESS ever lost a bid because of um, the difference in cost of security? Uh, it's, Congressman, it's hard to say if we've lost a bid because of the difference in our security cost. We've, we've certainly won and lost bids in Iraq. Uh, bids are based on either the best value or, in some cases, the, the lowest price. Mm -hmm. So we have lost some business, uh, but I can't tell you if it's attributable to our security factor or not. Right. As you go up that chain, is there a place where you can tell me, just based on your knowledge of the, the, the whole process and the industry, where there was any value added to that initial $600 paid to that contra individual contractor along the chain? Well, yes, I can, Congressman. I'll, I'll Sir, I'm the one best suited to answer okay. that with regard to Blackwater, if I may. Sure. Uh, there, there, there are two... Uh, serious areas of, of possible misunderstanding on that slide. The first is the fact that uh, the contract chain is reflected as, as being uh, KBR on log cap work and uh, my understanding, would, which may not be correct, is that that's, that has not been definitively determined. More to your question, uh, the, the numbers that keep coming up of 608.15, are, are, that's not the correct uh, calculus because uh, the assumption that, it, that anything other than the, the amount paid in labor costs is pure markup and pure profit is wrong because this is a fixed, uh, firm fixed price per day uh, situation. The uh, amount of profit out of the services. Well, that's were, the question I was asking. Where, yes, where is their value added to that $600 as it goes up the chain? Because ultimately the taxpayer is paying a lot more than that. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll try to answer your question directly. Uh, 815 is not the right number because of, there were multiple labor rates involved. The average labor rate, I think, is more reflective because the costs were spread among the different categories equally. So the blended labor rate of uh, 800 and approximately $885 per day per man, I think, is a more uh, useful way to discuss this. Out of that $885 per day that Blackwater invoiced to Regency, 
the average labor cost was $683 per day, and that went to the individual uh, security professional. Uh, $51.78 per day went to airfare. Uh, we, Blackwater was responsible for the initial movement, the initial mobilization of security professionals into Iraq. Um, supplies, including uh, the personal weapons, uh, ammunition, uh, personal gear for, the, for our men, that sort of thing, uh, was another 18 plus dollars per day. Uh, other costs, such as uh, lodging and transportation in the U.S., that would be from their home or record to Moyoc, uh, housing and birthing while they were uh, receiving training in Moyoc. Uh, freight, internet access, that sort of thing accounted for uh, another. Well, if I can interrupt you for a second, we had testimony that ESS didn't pay that. That was added costs. So not necessarily from you, but along the whole chain, housing costs and, and food wouldn't have been included. It might have been included at your level, but not subsequently. There are two different categories of housing costs, sir. That that Blackwater incurred uh, for the men prior to their arrival in theater and that which was the responsibility of Regency after they were in theater. Okay. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I, what I would like to ask, Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, and maybe you could get some answers from staff from, from me, but I was reading the uh, memorandum that we got today, and I found it interesting. I'm a little slow. Uh, but. It says, today's hearing provides an opportunity for the committee members to ask three basic questions about the extensive use of private security services. The first one says, are private security contractors operating in Iraq doing an adequate job? I haven't seen anybody from any of the two panels that could really testify to that, that I don't think any of them have ever been protected by one of these private security companies. So. I was wondering why that statement's in there. The second statement says, how much are they costing the federal taxpayer? I haven't seen anybody from either panel that works for the GAO who would know the answer to that. And then it says, and is the federal government providing sufficient oversight, which I think the majority staff pretty much answered itself on page three, it says U.S. contract employees may be prosecuted under American criminal law. And then in the next line, it says all security contractors in Iraq are under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So I'm kind of confused about the panels that we had today based on what the committee staff said we were supposed to find out. So. If you could just find out those answers, I think it would it would help us all. I can start to answer your question. Yeah. I think we can provide you some additional information. But we do have Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy of the United States Army, uh, Ms. Ballard, here today, who's actually been intimately involved in the issue of the use of taxpayer money, especially as it pertains to the contracts that we're dealing with today. In fact, there's been lots of correspondence between this committee uh, and Ms. Ballard and the Secretary of the Army, including a number of letters that I have sent, uh, that Mr. Waxman has sent, and others. And the focus of this hearing has been to try and put a lens on these contracting issues by looking at this particular case. And so I think these are the appropriate uh, individuals and witnesses to have to answer those questions. Okay, so, so um, the general lady from the Army would be who we would need to address the questions to as far as the cost? I'm asking, I mean, is that what I'm hearing? You're, you say? You're, feel free okay. to address any the, questions. The other point have. I wanted to make, and I'm glad you're in the chair, because I wanted to continue on with what Mr. Cannon talked about, the uh, letter from Callahan and Blaine, uh, continually used the word profiteering. And I thought it was also interesting that uh, they did copy you as the uh, DCCC chairman uh, with a letter, and I know that uh, the, the, the chairman uh, previously stated, and I believe him, that these hearings have no political ties. Um, and I found it interesting, as I was sitting here, I went to the uh, Waste, Fraud, and Abuse hotline and saw where the chairman had introduced a bill um, that was to do away with cronyism. And as I look at 
this letter from this attorney and who he addressed it to and all the contributions that he had made and his former law partner, I can hardly wait till we get into those cronyism uh, hearings. But uh, I think that we are walking on very thin ice when we start having public hearings with panels that are both the defendant and the plaintiff in something that's in a civil action. But I have a question for Mr. Howell. Uh, in the letter I referenced and that has been submitted for evidence from, Mr., uh, from Callahan and Blaine, they keep talking about profiteering. I was a contractor uh, before I got into politics uh, in the building business, and I used many subcontractors. In fact, I have been a subcontractor before uh, from another subcontractor. And if I understand profiteering, and Blackwater was specifically picked out in this letter, and I'm sure it was not for political reasons, even though it mentioned Blackwater as being a Republican com uh, company, and then the copy going to uh, Mr. Van Hollen, the DCCC chairman. But it keeps talking about profiteering. Now, on this particular contract, the, the thing that I've got says the federal government contracted with KBR that then contracted with ESS support services that then contracted with Regency Hotel, I mean, yeah, services, that then contracted with Blackwater. Now, being in the contracting business and talking about uh, profiteering, how can the last person or how can the person at the bottom of the totem pole be profiteering? Can you explain that to me? Sir, sir I, I don't see how they can be. And I, I also think that uh, the notion of profiteering is inherently incompatible with a competitively bid contract. What, 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 what would your definition of profiteering be? Uh, I, my understanding of the, the definition under the English language is someone seeking to make an excessive profit uh, when the, the person desiring the services is, is somehow in dire straits, if you will. Okay. And, and, and I think that's a pretty good um, definition. And I, as Mr. Isa was questioning you, I understand that you never got paid from Regency Services. Is that true on this particular contract? It was a little over $2 million? Uh, none of our invoices were paid. We did receive the initial mobilization payment. And if I may, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, would it be possible to make uh, th this ch chart uh, that, I, that we discussed at length part of the record just so it's clear? It's, it's been previously provided to the committee. Yes, sir. Thank and, you. And just one further question. You're sitting there with your uh, friend from ESS. Did they get paid? Thank you. I I'm not certain, sir. I think they can answer that. Did, did ESS get paid? Uh, on the contract that specifically is mentioned uh, so many times here today uh, that uh, the, where the um, four brave Americans lost their lives. You're asking me if ESS brought value? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding your question, Congressman. Did K KBR pay you for the services rendered that you subcontracted to Regency Hotel Services to then contracted with Blackwater. Did you get paid for the services that Blackwater and Regency Hotel Services subcontracted from you? Congressman, I'd like to address that kind of twofold. Number one, I think, I think it's uh, understand our contract was with Regency to provide security services. Did you get ESS? paid from Kellogg, Brown, and Root for that contract? That contract was now with Kellogg, Brown, and Root. So the answer to that would be no. Okay. So I got some bad information that uh, KBR did not subcontract to you on that particular contract? On that particular contract, I indicated earlier, it was, uh, it was a contract we ran out of Taji, which was not a KBR contract. I can't hear you. Could you speak up a little? I'm, I'm a little slow in hard. Yeah, here, as so. I mentioned earlier, that particular contract yeah. was yeah, run out of Taji, and that was not a KBR contract that ESS had. All right, we're going to have to... 
we're going to have to wrap okay. it up. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. D are there going to be further questions from other members of the panel? Because we're going to have to. Well, Mr. Okay. Mr. Chair, if if you're not coming back again, I would just like. No, to no, we 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 can come okay. back. If, if, yeah. But but if 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 we were not. Yeah. You're not referred to as the DCCC chair Mr. Chairman, on this letter. I, you yeah. are a member Mr. of Chairman, Congress. Thank you. I was going to thank, thank you. I was coming. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, been here for just about two and a half hours waiting for questions, so I, I'd like to come back. Well, we will do that. Just, just for the record, let me say my understanding, and I hadn't seen that letter, is that they uh, essentially copied members of the Democratic leadership, including Ms. Pelosi. And I'm also informed, apparently, that this firm uh, has contributed also to Republican uh, Republicans as well. I just think it's important for the record to reflect that this, this hearing uh, is been designed to get at the facts on the ground. I think it's done a good job of doing that and to suggest that there's some sort of uh, political motivation behind it other than trying to get to the truth of the matter uh, I think is unfortunate. Uh, we will now recess the committee until after the voting. Recess until 2.45. Meeting of the uh, committee will come back to order. To uh, continue questioning of this panel, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've heard a lot about the, um, the contracting, and I've done a fair amount of contracting in my life as an attorney, so um, I know when there's this multi tier contracting, it can get very confusing, it can be hard to pin down exactly what happened and we're talking about cost plus contracts, we're talking about fixed price contracts, we're talking about turnkey contracts, etc. And, you know, depending on what goes into developing a bid or, or how you, you load up a contract um, on the pricing side, you know, whether profiteering or markups that are more generous than they should be is occurring, um, th that can happen. And I, I think the inquiry will continue on whether the particular contract that we're looking at today um, had those characteristics, uh, or more generally, whether the environment in which uh, private contracting was being uh, engaged in Iraq uh, allowed for that kind of thing to occur. But that's, that's actually what I'm more interested in. I'm more interested in, in the, the larger environment because I frankly believe that a lot of the things that you do, Blackwater, ESS, uh, region, whatever, um, are things that you should not be doing. I, I think that, that this is symptomatic of a situation in which um, the Secretary of Defense's um, ideology, philosophy, sort of new notions of tactical warfare, uh, we're pushing this notion so that we were on, on a mad dash to slimming down our military. And most people agree that the initial response in terms of the number of troops um, in Iraq was inadequate, and that, that meant that there was space that our military should have occupied that now had to be occupied by someone else. And that's when people turned to the private contracting community to fill that space with the kinds of um, tragic results that, that, that can occur. So um, I, I really just have one question. I invite any of you uh, who wish to, to answer it, and that is, um, 
Did you yourselves ever reflect on whether you were in a space where you didn't belong? Um, did you ever ask your, Did you ever say to yourselves, "We we shouldn't be doing this. This this is something um, that the the armed forces should be engaged in. We're being put um, in an untenable position." So, anyone can answer that if they like. Maybe you'd like to start, Mr. Hamm. I think the best answer I can give is, is one based on my nearly 20 years as a naval officer, uh, informed, if you will, by my time with Blackwater. And I have to say that uh, it, it's ultimately a policy decision that's, that's set by Congress. But I think that the, the idea of using contractors to supplement and to aid the armed forces uh, is a valid one. We have a role to play. We have a contribution to make. And there are certain functions that, that we can do uh, at a, a cost efficiency when it's properly executed to the government that, uh, that free up soldiers to do, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors, to do service member tasks. Well, I, I allow that there will be situations where you have an appropriate role. I guess I'm asking whether you believe in this situation at all times you think the role that you played was appropriate. Not the way you executed it, because I understand that once you have the assignment, you're going to try to execute it. And whether you executed it well or not has been a subject of the discussion today. Um, but whether the assignments that you were being asked to execute were appropriate in this larger context of what our military should have been doing versus what the private contracting community should be doing. I, I believe that escorting personnel and convoy, convoys in a, a purely defensive role uh, is an acceptable uh, task for private security. Uh, I, that said, I, I believe and Blackwater supports appropriate uh, uh, government control thereover. And uh, if I could add one other thing that sort of slipped out of my mind, I had a massive amount of information that I tried to bring here today, and uh, I, I don't want to uh, not uh, provide proper respect to Ms. Nolan, and I want to just clarify she was former White House counsel for the Clinton White House. Does anyone else have a response? Mr. To Starbiz, that? Just, to, yeah. just to remind you, what I said earlier, I don't know if you were here for that. The unusual situation taking place in Iraq today is three simultaneous actions. There is a military action and the work that is supporting the, the contractors who are supporting the military, accompanying the force, uh, that has been longstanding, uh, weapon system support, logistic support, traditional. There is the reconstruction activity, and that is usually followed a military activity. We are now doing that simultaneously. And an economic development, a developmental assistance activity, all taking place in a very confined space. That's created some ambiguity about who's there doing what, for what purposes. And I think that clarity is very important in your, in your thought process about the appropriate role of contractors. And do you agree that having that kind of ambiguity can create dangerous situations? Absolutely. For people on the ground? Okay. It, it absolutely creates uh, difficult situations, confusion. Uh, unclear lines of authority and responsibility and uh, questions on, on both parts. And confusion, would you agree, could all, can, can lead to situations both where there is, um, there is abuse in, in terms of, of way, the way contracts and assignments come together and clearly can also lead to situations where there's, where there's tragedy as well? There's clearly tragedy. I'm not sure that uh, it, by definition, you have abuse. Uh, you, confusion could create ambiguity. Ambiguity could create uh, a variety of situations that may not be abuse of the process. Gentlemen's okay. time is Thank up. You. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Under Secretary Ballard, I have a simple question. I hope you, uh, I, I assume you'll be able to answer this uh, uh, because you're of your position. Uh, how many uh, private security uh, contractors are currently working for the U.S. government in Iraq? 
Sir, that is a very broad question, and I am unable to answer that question. It's a very complex situation on the ground. There are many organizations over there that may have private security contractors, and a lot of these security contracts are subcontracts okay. under Prime. Thank you. Thank you. There are approximately 60, according to the research we've done. Uh, I ask Mr. Howell. Uh, Blackwater is one of those 60 currently working in Iraq. Uh, providing security services. Is that not correct? We are currently providing security services right. in Iraq to the U.S. government. Yes, sir. All right. What, what, what year was the company founded? 1997. What year did the company receive its first contract from the U.S. government? 1998. Who was in the White House in 19... Pardon me. I know that's a, a bit ridiculous to ask. Um, it was obviously William Jefferson Clinton, a Democrat. Um, and it seems that the questioning here today is that these are uh, sort of a, a Republican scandal that we have contractors working for the U.S. government providing essential security services for us uh, in war zones. It's actually something very common uh, for the last 200 years, uh, working with uh, firms, private sector firms, to provide needed uh, uh, resources for our military and for our diplomats overseas. Uh, so I apologize for asking that question because it was obviously a Democrat administration that gave you your first contract. Uh, I think it's also ironic that there's a big discussion from the chairman of this committee and Democrat leadership about a company called Halliburton and how it's a, a, this Republican scandal that Halliburton's getting uh, contracts from the U.S. government. Uh, I think today, uh, it, uh, Mr. Uh, Siegel, uh, you work for what firm? I work for KBR, uh, which, uh, which Kellogg is Brown and Root, which is a subsidiary of. That's correct, of Halliburton. Of Halliburton. How many questions have you been asked today by this panel? Uh, one question, I believe. One question? Was it just now? No, I was. There was a simple yes or no question that was earlier. Oh, very good. How long have you been here? Uh, for about three hours. Three hours. It's kind of interesting. I find in, in this uh, that a lot of. Uh, uh, vitriol is heaped on your organization, but there are even no, not even a, a question asked of you. Uh, but back to you, uh, Mr. Howe. Um, I understand there's an ongoing lawsuit uh, which uh, Callahan and Blaine have filed on the behalf of families uh, that, that were uh, uh, taken down in action. Uh, it's a very sad thing. Uh, I also know that uh, a, a letter that's already been uh, admitted to the record here uh, re refers to you and, and other contractors as extremely Republican companies. It's ironic coming from a law firm that is extremely Democratic, and it's ironic that they send this letter to the Speaker of the House and CC the committee chair here, but also uh, copy the Democrat campaign committee chair. Well, it might not be ironic because, after all, this, this law firm has given over $60,000 to Democrats over the years. Uh, so it, this might be another pay-to-play uh, prospect here in Washington, D.C., where Democrat donors get the investigations that they wish uh, in order to help their law firm win a lawsuit. Uh, and so uh, if you could comment uh, just in terms of, in legal terms, about this uh, idea of turning a, a private lawsuit into a legislative show trial. So I think the best answer I can give is to refer to uh, a U.S. Supreme Court case that's been around for a, a large part of the existence of our republic. It's uh, a case uh, that's known as, by the name Kilborn. It goes back to 1880, and it, it uh, established the longstanding principle that uh, in certain circumstances, congressional involvement in private litigation uh, can be unlawful. And they're, they're obviously, it's a very complex issue, a lot of subsequent case law, but that's the, that's the general principle that I think you're asking about. Thank you, sir. Um, I think it's also interesting and important to note that this, this committee hearing that we have here today and the original, uh, according to House rules, uh, the minority side is uh, entitled to receive notification about what the hearing is intended to be about. Uh, and then the night before, we receive a supplemental document that completely changes the notion of this hearing. So I want to apologize to you individuals working in the private sector and, and uh, Undersecretary Ballard, who works 
uh, for the government for having to waste a, a full day on a hearing that is nothing more than a show trial for a Democrat uh, trial lawyer firm. And I apologize to you for that. Uh, I think it shows that, uh, you know, the, the new majority and uh, the new leadership of this committee is intent on uh, making political hay out of something that simply is not uh, a valid point. And I apologize that you have to be uh, uh, brought in uh, to be a, a part of the spectacle. Gentleman's time has expired, and I must say that uh, he just was so partisan in what you had to say without a foundation for it. I have no idea who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. I know that the four people, four men who lost their lives were Americans. I don't know whether they're Democrats or Republicans. I know Americans, Democratic and Republican, are paying taxes and they don't want their taxes wasted. And I think Congress should be following uh, up on these investigations and asking witnesses qu questions. And I must say I'm outraged at Ms. Ballard coming here to represent the Army and not being able to give us a, an answer to the simple question of how many contractors and subcontractors have contracts with the Army. I mean, that's what this hearing was all about, and we couldn't even get an answer from that on that point. So I, I know the gentleman wants to look at partisanship under every rock, but I suggest that he uh, return to that, under that rock and look at his own uh, reasons for trying to make everything partisan. This is not a partisan investigation, nor I, it should be. I think be. it's rather partisan. And I resent that you're to trying to make it a rock. I, I resent that you're trying to make it a partisan one. Gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich is now recognized. Secretary Ballard, the President recently gave a, an order that uh, uh, was basically a shoot-to-kill order for anybody who was coming in from Iran, was thought to be an operative of the Iranian government. Uh, does that uh, order extend to the personnel uh, hired by the companies who are here? Is that, does that private contractors, do they, are they given the authority to go and shoot to kill Iranian operatives in Iraq? Congressman, those orders are executive orders that deal outside my area, which is strictly contracting. Okay. Uh, well, this is contracting in a, in a sort. Um, Mr. Howe, we've heard from the families on the first panel that they had to sue Blackwater to get information about what happened to their relatives. Then we heard something else that I have to say astounded me uh, in its callousness, and that is that Blackwater filed a countersuit against the families for $10 million. Now, Mr. Howe, uh, you're the general counsel for Blackwater. Why did the company sue the families that lost two sons, a husband, and a father? First, let me say that, uh, once again, extend our deepest condolences to the family that their loss is, is almost Was the lawsuit part of those condolences? The lawsuit was not against the families. We seek nothing from the families, and we have sought to support them. The lawsuit was against a North Carolina attorney who established hollow estates that, that did not contain any assets of the fallen men, their homes, their cars. They were just shell estates established for the purpose of personal injury litigation. And the lawsuit, uh, the claim against that attorney was for violation of our agreements with the men. So, they, so you're saying the, that attorney violated your agreement? Did they make a, what did they do? They make a misstatement? Did they, uh, how did they violate your agreement? Our agreement with the men provided that uh, any dispute regarding, that involved Blackwater would be resolved via arbitration. And that's where we are seeking to, to have this matter addressed. Did you have a contract uh, with the men that they shouldn't, uh, who, who fought for your, uh, for your company there? Did they, uh, they have a contract with you that they um, uh, did, had no right to sue, couldn't seek publicity, they had to protect uh, certain information? And, uh, and that uh, they would have to assume all risks of being shot, killed by a firearm, uh, terrorist activity, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Did you have a contract with them to that effect? The terms of their contract included a waiver regarding uh, certain injuries or death at, uh, in certain circumstances, and it also contained provisions regarding uh, confidentiality. But aren't you, in effect, suing the estates of the decedents? Isn't that what you're doing? No, none of the property that is in the 
the meaningful estates, the, the actual estates of the decedents, is involved in, in uh, what we're. There's no connection to do. whatsoever with the action you're taking and the decedents of property, their their estates. The the estates that are at issue in the Norton litigation, as I understand it, are. Uh, have no assets at all. They're, they were established solely for the purpose of personal injury litigation. And, uh, and could you tell me then, uh, is it your position that, uh, uh, that this uh, attorney you're talking about has violated an agreement and that's why you're suing? In, in a very... <laughs> As the shortest possible answer, that's a, that's a summary of the gist of the argument. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to raise an issue regarding Blackwater's prior testimony in front of, in front of Congress. Uh, Mr. Uh, Waxman, uh, Blackwell testified before a National Security Subcommittee of this committee. On, um, Blackwater testified on 6-1306. And I had asked uh, questions about their contracts. Uh, the Blackwater's vice president testified that Blackwater charges $815 per day for the services of independent security contractor working in Iraq. And uh, he testified that the $815 charge was fully burdened. Uh, specifically, he provided the following response to me. I asked, in those contracts, is it true you were paying your men $600 a day but billing Regency $815 a day? He said, per the presentation, uh, Mr. Kucinich, $815 a day is the right figure, but it's a fully burdened figure. That includes travel, training, gear, housing, food, the works, fully burdened uh, number. And then, but the documents obtained by this committee, Mr. Chairman, refute the claim that these were fully burdened. We received the contract between Regency and Blackwater, which clearly provide information contrary to Mr. Taylor's claims. One, that housing costs were the responsibility of ESS, not Blackwater, Two, that food subsistence for the contractors was the responsibility of ESS, not Blackwater. And three, insurance was to be paid by ESS, not Blackwater. Now, Mr. Chairman, I know my time has expired. Uh, I think that since, you know, I have information here that says that Mr. Taylor presented misleading testimony under oath to our committee, and I'm going to ask if this uh, committee would look further into that to try to reconcile uh, what he said and what the facts are as this committee has been able to determine them. The, the gentleman will permit. Uh, we will uh, take a look at that issue with you and uh, pursue further uh, clarifications for the people involved. I think it would be good to get it clarified because uh, uh, the exchange that we had really didn't leave a positive impression. It seems to me there may have been an effort by Blackwater to mislead or conceal rele relevant information from the Congress. I thank the chair for his uh, willingness to look at it further. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I believe there's a grave misunderstanding here, and I, I would like just a moment to address it. I respect the time constraints, but th th no it's, this is a fundamental Please, misunderstanding. Uh, we want to be fair. Go ahead. And say yes, what sir. You have to say. Uh, if, if we could put up uh, this graph uh, that reflects the 800 and, uh, approximately $885. Uh, dollars per man per day that was uh, that was invoiced by Blackwater. If we could put that up on the the Elmo, I believe it'll help help clarify this. Uh, the uh, the testimony that Mr. Taylor gave, is, as I understand it, is that Blackwater's costs, meaning uh, things such as uh, weapons, ammo, personal gear, and, and to go directly to to Congressman Kucinich's point, housing provided while at Blackwater prior to the men going in theater, food provided to men while at Blackwater that sort of thing. Those were costs that Blackwater had to pay. Uh, they came out of the $884.97 per day average uh, daily rate that was invoiced to Regency. Uh, and and the, the amount that was the, the markup or the profit, if you will, was approximately $10.61 per day of the, out of that 885. So it, it's, it's approximately 1%. That There are basically two different categories of, of expenses, if you will. There, there are in-theater expenses, which Mr. Kucinich is, is absolutely correct in stating that uh, Regency was responsible for providing housing, food, things like that when the men were in theater, but there were similar expenses that were incurred black, by Blackwater prior to the men going in theater. For example, when they were receiving training in Moyoc, that were Blackwater costs that were uh, born by Blackwater and that were incorporated into our invoices, although, again, the invoices were never paid. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm asking unanimous consent to be able to uh, have uh, 
five minutes of time to continue the questioning because he said something that doesn't square with the, some facts here, and I'd like to just know if you'd, if I could have a unanimous consent to ask some questions. Yeah, I have no problem. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to um, see if the gentleman can handle it in three minutes, and if not, uh, okay, I, I, that's but, fine. Uh, Mr. Shea's, uh, with Mr. Shea's is being uh, kind enough to. Uh, Reserve his opportunity for questioning until you've completed I, yours. I, 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 I thank you. I thank the chair. I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Mr. Murray, did uh, did ESS pay for the uh, housing costs? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Congressman. As could you could you pull the mic closer? Pull it closer. Okay. E ESS was responsible uh, for you, the housing. Did, did ESS pay for the housing costs? Could you answer yes or no? ESS paid for the housing costs. Did while ESS they were in pay theater. for the food costs? While they were in theater, yes. Did ESS pay insurance? Yes. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that that doesn't square with what um, with what Mr. The impression Mr. Howell is trying to give this committee. Now, um, Mr. Murray, uh, the same contract also shows that Regency, not Blackwater pay the cost of rotation travel. Is that correct? I, I can't answer that. I'm not aware of that. The same contract shows that Regency, not Blackwater, paid for the individual body armor, heavy weapons, vehicles, navigational devices, and personnel radios. Is that correct? Congressman, our contract was with Regency. ESS's contract was with Regency, not with Blackwater. And I uh, had a turnkey service with Regency to provide all of our security services except for those few items that were cost reimbursable or those items that ESS would provide. ESS would provide the accommodations and the right. food while in theater. We pay for the DBA insurance and we pay for fuel and a few other items that were cost reimbursable. All of the services well, the point, were part the point, of that, that turnkey service. Thank you for answering that. And the point is that uh, Mr. Howe, uh, it does not appear that Mr. Taylor's testimony was accurate. You know, he said $815 per day charge was so high because Blackwater had to pay for housing and meals and insurance. But in fact, this was not the case, according to the contract documents. And what made it worse was that Mr. Taylor was given a chance to go back and consult with the company, provide a follow-up response in writing, and when he did so, he sent a letter dated July 14, 2006, reaffirming his testimony, stating $815 is what is known as the fully burdened rate. Now, Mr. Howell, do you know why Mr. Taylor would continue to insist on this information, which appears to be erroneous and, and misleading, and twice be, in, to, in communicating with this committee. Sir, Blackwater incurred housing costs, subsistence costs, travel costs, and things like that that were that were properly its expenses under the contracts. The Blackwater Regency contract did provide that Regency would pay for some housing, some subsistence some travel, but Blackwater also paid for some of those uh, expenses. For example, the initial deployment of the personnel into Iraq was uh, Blackwater's responsibility, so Blackwater did pay for some travel, and that uh, I believe that's clear from the contracts. Mr. Um, Chairman, I don't think that's responsive. I mean, it, you know, I'd I just like to conclude by saying that, um, you know, they only got paid when the troops were in theater, and I think it's important to uh, to keep that in mind because it, it goes back to the question of whether, in fact, the uh, taxpayers of the United States have, uh, have been overcharged. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Shays? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I really appreciate you having this hearing. And I have um, a, a lot of, of, of questions pretty much because I don't understand certain relationships. But what I do understand is this. We need contractors. Uh, they enable our troops to focus on being the tip of the spear and not being setting up housing, not, uh, not uh, manning the kitchens, uh, and, and contract it out. So that part makes sense to me. And I understand the Kellogg Brown and Root, their log cap contract that they were under during this phase of the war was actually negotiated under the previous presidency. Is that correct? It's correct. Yeah. So that contract, and I hate to say it, it's the kind of contract I see with FEMA. In other words, you, you're contracted, and when an emergency arises, you're on board, and, and you take over. And there's logic to doing that. So you know, uh, 
and you, when you, so let me understand this. When you negotiate a contract, it may involve a lot of work or not all that much work. You never know. Is that correct? That's correct. How long do the contracts usually last, Mr. Siegel? Uh, this contract was a one-year base contract with 10 option years. So it, you could just, you have the right to roll it over for 10 years? No, the Army has the right to okay. continue so, for but, 10 years. So they contracted it under the Clinton administration, but it was renewed under the Bush administration. Is that correct? Uh, if you do it every year? Yes, correct. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I understand why if you hire someone for food service, they may want to engage someone who has a service that they don't provide, like security. So I can understand a subcontract there, and I can understand, I, I understand in the lot cap that they have to eat that cost. Is that correct? That, that ESS, for instance, would have to eat the cost of security? If it's a log cab contract, uh, log cab contract states that the military will provide our force protection. Uh, we so, think and if you you don't think it's being provided adequately, and you choose to get security, contract out security, you're allowed to do that, but then you have to pay the cost. We haven't asked any subcontractors to subcontract well, for security. Well, let me understand. We asked for a turnkey price to provide a service. Okay, now when you uh, when you subcontracted when e e -S -E -E -S contra ESS rather contracted with Regency um, um, what Regency then negotiated with Blackwater, correct? I don't know, sir. We we contracted with ESS for a turnkey job. It was not an itemized bid. See, but, but, I mean, okay, I understand you don't know, but it's not comforting because what it's like is you can be Pontius Pilate and wash your hands of it. In other words, you contract with someone else, they get the job done, and, and it's their responsibility and not your responsibility. That's what well, we, we certainly don't wash our hands. It's a competitively bid project. Right, but they, they, bid it. they bid the contract, and then it's theirs. But it was yours, and you subbid it, correct? You, you subcontracted. Yes, sir. We you subcontracted, subcontracted the ES, ESS. Correct. Then ESS subcontracts to Regency to provide any uh, service they need to meet those contract requirements. And then Regency then engage, engage Blackwater. I don't know who our subcontractors well, determine I, they need to perform the contract. They, well, they I'm, give I'm, us I'm, a firm. I program. understand you don't. I'm going to just tell you what I think. I think you should know. I think the system should somehow require it. I think there should be some some responsibility to it. And my analogy of Pontius Pilate is it, it is you, you, you just wash your hands of it. It's not your responsibility. I just can't believe that if I were doing a contract for a building and I was subcontracting, that I would be oblivious to who my subcontract subcontractors we're, in, we're, we're dealing with. So I, it just strikes me as something I'm surprised by, that's all. Maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe that's the way it works. But um, I, we, we did good things with contractors and we did some bad things with contractors. And the bad things have given the good concept a bad name. Miss um, Ballard, I, I am surprised that you can't give us an idea of the number of contracts and the number of contractors in theater. Is that because you just tire out from the first and then from then on you, you, you don't feel you have an interest in or responsibility to know who, the, who is subcontracted? In other words, once you put out that contract, whoever is subcontracted is not your interest or responsibility? I can tell you how many contracts... Put the mic closer to you, please. I can tell you how many contract actions have been awarded in Iraq. How many subcontracts, you are correct. The prime has responsibility for the subcontract. We do not have privity of contract with the subs. And so you, you, don't, you don't know who they hire? You don't know uh, the quality of who they hire and so on? We have with the primes a quality surveillance plan and a quality plan that is monitored by the Defense Contract Management Agency I to don't ensure know what that, that means. I honestly don't we know have quality plans in place that are monitored to ensure that the prime is doing what he committed to do in terms of monitoring his subcontractors, Gentlemen, but we don't actually yeah. monitor the yeah. subs. Yeah, happy to yield. Do you say you, you do know the number of prime contracts you have? I know how many actions that we had in um, Iraq. In JCCI in fiscal year 06, we had 26,994 contract actions. I can't tell you that those were all security contract actions. In fact, can you um, tell us whether they're all prime? Those are all prime contract so actions. So 26,000? 
994 actions out of JCCI, the Joint Contracting Actions Command means a I contract? Read. Yes. So you had to, close to 27,000 contracts, and then you don't know how many of those contractors had subcontractors. Correct. And you don't know how many of those subcontractors had subcontractors. Correct. Yeah. See, I mean, tell me why I shouldn't be concerned by that. I mean, maybe you could tell me, Sue. Tell me. I mean, you're smiling, but I mean, it, it, it's it, well, look, it, a, a it contract is a concern to me. You should be concerned. A contract action is not a contract or. <coughs> Uh, so there may be fewer, there would, my, my guest, Ms. Ballard, would know that there are fewer contractors, many of whom are receiving multiple uh, transactions. So the number of contract actions does not equal on a one-to-one -one basis the number of contractors. Uh, the subcontract relationships, uh, there is uh, the elements of transparency, elements of visibility on the ground. Some of that may not be known in a database where it's easily obtainable. Uh, either at a uh, higher level or at headquarters uh, or here? Well, let me just conclude. Um, what I know is this, <laughs> that this would be something I'd recommend to the Subcommittee on Government Reforms Oversight on National Security because I think, you know, just a few members uh, who could ask questions for 10 or 15 minutes, we could get a better understanding. But I was, I was always left with the feeling that our government would know who the contractors were, who the subcontractors, who got a subcontract from a subcontractor. I, I, I just thought it would be intuitive that we would know how many people and so on. And the fact that once the major contractor subcontracts, they don't care who's subcontracting that, is of concern to me. And it, and it tells me that, it's, that we're not going to have good quality control and that we're going to have pretty serious mistakes. And, and I'd just add to this that if, in fact, uh, a, anybody who was a contractor was told he better get his butt out there, even without proper protection, uh, weapons, and so on, um, I think the co company has to be held responsible. Congressman Shades, if I may, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we don't have any visibility at all of the subcontracts. We do have a consent to subcontract process, and there are clauses in the contract that require the contractor to notify us when they are taking certain subcontract actions at certain dollar thresholds. But that regulation is very clear as to what that information will be, and it says specifically that we are not in our consent to that subcontract consenting to the terms and conditions of those contracts the price of those subcontracts or the allowability of cost under those contracts. But the contractor does come to us and tell us that they are subcontracting based on what the contract specifically asks. But to my knowledge, we don't have any system where we automatically keep track of then every subcontract that a subcontractor or a prime contractor lets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. I, this leads in, this, this point leads into some questions I had. So if the gentleman from Maryland would allow me to go, go ahead of him. The um, question of oversight over the activities of these private security contractors, um, this problem is illustrated by the clear indications that there was unauthorized private security work under government contracts, but the Defense Department and prime contractors were not even aware of it or did nothing to address it. Uh, Mr. Flores, uh, Floor uh, Corporation has a similar provision in its contract with the Air Force. Uh, contractor force protection. The U.S. government will provide for the security of contractor personnel in convoys and on site, commensurate with the threat and in accordance with the applicable theater anti-terrorism slash for protection guidelines. Um, do you agree that the, this provision bars not just floor but its subcontractors from using private security contractors? Uh, in the case that you're speaking of and in all those cases where we have to use government for those security requirements. Uh, we have never acquiesced to our subs to have uh, private security, uh, at least on the site and working with us in getting, the, uh, getting that particular task done. What, what would you do if you determined that one of your subcontractors had violated this provision? Would you report it to the Army or the Defense Department? Uh, what we would certainly do, I think, a good example uh, was at Taji. Uh, we recognized that the Army was having trouble supporting uh, ESS, and uh, Lauren Badenhorst coordinated with uh, our project director, and we went back to the Army and said, it's not working. 
we're anxious to get this bed down project completed for soldiers so that we will improve their quality of life on this base. But the Army said, no, you can't use private security on this. We kept beating on the Army because of this, but if the Army determines that their soldiers are living in certain conditions and they don't have the personnel or other missions come up that preclude them from providing that convoy escort, we're not going to go past the provisions of our contract and suggest to our subs that they need to get private security. In a letter to Congressman Shays dated July 14, 2006, the Secretary of the Army stated, quote, under the provisions of the log cap contract, the U.S. military provides all armed forces protection for KBR unless otherwise directed. Additionally, the log cap contract states that KBR personnel cannot carry weapons without the explicit approval of the theater commander, end quote. Uh, in your written testimony, Mr. Siegel, you acknowledge that KBR contractors have used private security contractors. Doesn't that violate the terms of the log cap contract? Uh, to clarify, I said we had other non-log cap contracts in which we subcontracted for armed security. Uh, KBR has never directly subcontracted for armed security under the log cap Is your contract. mic on? I, I'm having... KBR has never directly subcontracted for armed security under the log cap contract. You've done it through ESS, though? Uh, we have not required or directed any of our subcontractors to subcontract for security either. Well, the majority of our contracts are firm fixed price, competitively bid. Uh, we award them on best value to the government, fully understanding are, that are that's... You are you now aware that they did, that you did subcontract with ESS on, for security, private security? Was I aware that ESS had, at this time, I understand, when we initially had this conversation with the Army, uh, we were focused on had Blackwater ever worked for KBR, uh, to which the response was no. Uh, we were initially told by ESS and Blackwater both uh, that Blackwater was not contracted uh, to KBR. Uh, well, well, let me ask you about this. James Ray of KBR wrote this email on June 3rd, 2004. Four. And it said, we should not attempt to effect a material change in our contract with the government by hiring a company that we know uses armed escorts. That company is an agent of KBR, and if anything happens, KBR is in the pot with them. Even with lipstick, a pig is a pig. <laughs> Ms. Ballard, there seems to be a disagreement here on whether the Defense Department prohibits the use of private security contractors on these contracts. Why is there so much confusion about such a simple issue? Contracts contain different provisions. In the case of the log cap contract, there was a specific provision that prohibited the use of private security contractors. There are others, the design build contracts, for example, that expressly said that the contractors would be providing their own security and the proposals included those security costs. Well, log cap has an agreement they won't have these private security people, but they did it. Now what happens? What happened when we had all the data that demonstrated that they had, in fact, incurred these costs and passed them on to the government? The contracting officer issued a payment adjustment and yesterday withheld $19.6 million. I'm sorry, they didn't withhold it. They removed it from the KBR payments. Um, it seems to me that if the that the Defense Department and the prime contractors sometimes don't seem to have an idea of what's going on lower down on the contracting chain. And it may be acceptable not to have any oversight over subcontractors who provide paper clips, but it's not acceptable when the subcontractors are putting armed forces in the field. That's my big concern. And I think it should be all of our concern. And if the contracts don't allow it, those contracts need to be enforced. Um, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank all our witnesses uh, today. And you, you covered a lot of the material I was going to go over, and so I'm not going to uh, go back over uh, in great detail. But as you know, we, we sort of launched on this effort many, many uh, months ago in terms of looking at some of the sum contracts, and it began as an effort to try and determine whether from the taxpayer's perspective some of this layering of subcontracts, cost plus subcontracts, was a good deal for the taxpayer or not a good deal for the taxpayer because it did appear to be lots of markups 
uh, that accumulated and, and with a big price tag at the end of it. And during that process, uh, we looked into whether or not the contracts between KBR and the others in the subcontractor chain uh, permitted uh, the contracting for uh, private uh, security uh, personnel. And as was testified to uh, by uh, Ms. Ballard, the, the contracts with KBR prohibited, essentially, both KBR and, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your, your view also remains that it also prohibits subcontractors under that prime contract uh, from uh, essentially engaging private security. Is that right, Ms. Ballard? That's correct. Okay. And it was on that basis that you made the decision, as I understand, just yesterday to, to at least withhold or to, did you withhold it? You took back 19 We points. took back 19.6 million. 19.6 million. And that was your estimate, I take it, of the amount of monies under this KBR log cap contract that had gone for the private security component. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to get a better sense of the Blackwater, uh, and, and, and that, how much of that was to, was that most of it going through this process to the Blackwater private security? What we relied on was a letter that was referred to earlier from ESS to KBR that said there was a factor applied to their direct labor cost, and our analysts then did the calculations against that to take the funds back from KBR. Okay. Um, so that was done through your your discussions with ESS? It was KBR that notified us that this had occurred. Okay. Um, with respect to the, the Blackwater uh, private security folks, were they, you were operating under this in your contract. Did you understand that you were operating under the log cop contract with KBR? No, sir. We've, uh, we have not been certain uh, which contract applied. What we did know was, was two key facts. We were subcontracted to Regency, and ultimately we were providing services to the U.S. military. Okay. So you're the, the, the personnel that we, whose family members we heard from earlier, you, you hired pursuant to your contract with Regency, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And I guess for the Regency person, representative here, was that, was that contract, the, the KBR contract that were uh, talking about today that log cap contract. Well, <clears throat> Congressman, I don't think there's a representative from oh, I'm Regency. Sorry. The ESS, but I'm with the ESS. ESS yeah, I'm sorry. We were the we contracted Regency to do our security services. Turnkey service we we contracted for for all of our contracts. It wasn't targeted for KBR or non KBR. It was across all of our contracts, both with KBR with the direct with the military and commercial contracts. When we had a security mission going to one of those camps or sites, Regency would, would carry that mission for us. Right, but, but let me just make sure I understand. The, the $19 million that was withheld yesterday, taken back yesterday, was, was essentially part of the funds that you initially charged the government under this contract. Is that right? I'm not aware of that, Congressman. I'm not aware of the withhold or the the action the Army's taken. Okay. Well, let me ask, I guess, the representative, well, let me ask Ms. Ballard, do you, was that pursuant to this, this chain of contracts that we've been talking to about today? Yes, sir, it was. And okay. if I might further inquire on that, may I assume that it has to do with the fact that you were going to be coming before this hearing today and therefore punitive action was warranted and you took it? No, sir. We received our positive confirmation on January the 30th, and from then until yesterday, we accumulated the documentation to solidify our decision. We consulted with counsel and other agencies that bear upon that decision, and then we were able to take action. This was important because KBR has the right to dispute this, so it was important that we have our facts in order before we take action. Well, I'm pleased that you have your facts in order and you took action, but I haven't heard of too much action taken by the Defense Department and actually denying money to, to KBR and some of these contractors. So if even though you don't want to acknowledge this, I think that the, the fact we are holding this hearing today might have saved the government $20 million. Well, thank, thank you. And I, again, appreciate the letter we received yesterday. I think Mr. Waxman and I both received uh, a letter yesterday. And let me just, uh, with, with respect to the, uh, the, the KBR 
uh, contract here. Is the, is the reason that you, the U.S. government takes the position that they cannot subcontract out for private security uh, uh, services because the expectation is that the U.S. military will provide for that security? The clause in the contract does stipulate that the U.S. military will provide that security. Okay. Did, uh, to your knowledge, did any of the entities, the subcontractors in this chain of subcontracts we're talking about today, did they request that the U.S. military provide security? We have in writing from KBR that they nor any of their subs ever requested in writing for this security. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Um, Mr. Kucinich had just one question he wanted to ask, and we'd get a, an answer for the record. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to submit for the record a, a story that was uh, in the January 11, 2007 uh, edition of the, um, of the pilot uh, newspaper. And it relates to, um, the headline says, Iraq killing track to contractor could test laws. Now, um, Mr. the question is this, um, Mr. Howe, um, are you, are you uh, familiar with a December 24th shooting uh, involving one of your uh, employees who shot and killed an Iraqi security officer? Uh, and uh, are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with some aspects of it, yes, sir. Did your company order that man back to the States? That uh, gentleman, when the, on the day the incident occurred, he was uh, off duty. Uh, Blackwater uh, did bring him back to the to the United States, and uh, our client also uh, understandably directed that he be off the project immediately. Uh, his security clearance was revoked, and uh, there is um, other activity going on, sir. Is he going to be extradited back to Iraq for murder? And if not, why not? Sir, I, I am not law enforcement. I, I, all I can say is that there is currently an investigation by, uh, as I understand it, the FBI and the Department of Justice of the incident that day, and uh, we are fully cooperating and supporting that investigation. And what action they'll take, sir, I, I can't say. But, but Thank wait, you, Mr. Kucinich, because Mr. Welch has been waiting. And uh, uh, if you have further questions, if you would submit it in writing, and we would appreciate responses in writing. Mr. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I appreciate your indulgence, and I, I just want to point out that, uh, that there's a question that could actually make their, their uh, corporate officers accessories here in helping to, uh, to uh, in, uh, create a flight from justice for uh, someone who's committed a, a murder. And so that's why I feel it's important that we get these answers. Thank you. Well, let's get the answers before we make the charges. Uh, and uh, we, we would certainly welcome further responses to questions that either Mr. Kucinich or any member of the committee may further want to ask and uh, have you respond to in writing for the record. We'll keep the, the, the hearing record open for another week. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're going to conclude the questioning for uh, the Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Howell, uh, Blackwater has multiple contracts with the federal government. Uh, including the Defense Department, State, and other agencies. And it has uh, contracts, of course, with other uh, companies. And I want to ask you about whether Blackwater will be getting any additional contracts in the near future. And specifically, to your knowledge, uh, is Blackwater currently under consideration for any sole source or no-bid contract from the Defense Department or any other federal agency? Not to my knowledge, sir. Uh, we have, an, at any given time, we have a number of business initiatives in progress, including U.S. government work. And I, I, to my knowledge, no, but we may. I, I can't say definitively, sir. So you will confirm yes or no and get back with a specific answer? Uh, yes, sir. And if I could caveat, uh, with, if we could make it with regard to unclassified matters. Uh, has Blackwater had any communications with the Defense Department uh, or any other agencies in the past several months regarding a contract to provide emergency evacuation services? I, I don't know, sir. And you'll check? I will check. 
And does Blackwater currently own any helicopters that are designed for defensive purposes or for evacuating people quickly? Um, a helicopter defined, designed for defensive purposes, as I, as a, as a military person, understand it, would be like an Apache attack helicopter. We, we don't own anything in that nature. In terms of evacuation, uh, any utility helicopter that would be moved for person, normally used for personal movement, would be suitable for evacuation. All right. And has Blackwater been trying to raise capital, to your knowledge, to purchase or lease helicopters of this sort? Uh, in order to potentially provide services to the United States government? Mr. Congressman, that, that, uh, answering that question necessarily would harm a competitive U.S. government bidding process that's, that's underway. Uh, I, I'm happy to answer it, but I, I would uh, ask that in the interest of preserving competition, we do so in a closed session or in writing. Or, or in, you will do that in writing? Yes, sir. Thank you. I want to ask you about the Fallujah incident. Uh, I heard you testify about Blackwater's concern for its employees, members of the team, and all of us uh, take seriously uh, the genuineness of that uh, uh, statement. Uh, but you heard the four women who were here, and uh, they had a question about what happened and why. My understanding is that your company has done an incident report. As I understand it, there was more than one inquiry into the events of that day. Right. Yes, so your, your company has done an inquiry, maybe not just one, but several, correct? I was not referring solely to Blackwater, sir. Well, I'm asking you about Blackwater. You're Blackwater. Yes, sir. And I'm asking you about Blackwater. Have you done a, an incident report? Uh, there was, there were, there was a, an investigation, yes, sir. Is, is my question complicated? Have you no, done a report No, sir, I'm just trying to be clear. Yes, right. sir, we have done a report. Right. And you understand that uh, you are a member of the military. Yes. And obviously, when uh, the military loses uh, one of their sons or daughters, they uh, provide information to the family as much as they have about what happened, correct? With one important caveat, sir, that there are instances where the military does not, and, and I can discuss that in, not in a public forum. Well, the military takes seriously its ability to help families who are grieving come to terms with their loss by doing one of the most basic and human steps that an organization can take, and that's to provide as much information as they can. Correct? Yes, sir. What's the problem? about answering the question to these four people who lost their loved ones by telling them everything you know about what happened and how it happened so they can have the one thing they're requesting and that's the truth. <coughs> Sir, some of the facts of that day were classified by the government and, and we are not permitted to discuss them. Well, let me ask you this. This committee has requested copies of that report or reports, correct? Yes, sir. Will you turn over to this committee those reports? Sir, we, we cannot turn over uh, classified information. It would, it would be a criminal act. Just, if the gentleman would permit, that's not an accurate statement. We are entitled to receive classified information in this committee. This was requested in our document request to you, and we, we are uh, expecting to receive that uh, information from you. I understand, sir. Ms. Ballard, uh, do, are you aware of whether there was a report that was done uh, in the Pentagon concerning this incident? No, sir, I'm not. Is, is that anything within your knowledge that you could respond to questions from me about, or do I have the wrong person here? Wrong person, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to be certain I understand that you've made it clear that this committee has requested the Fallujah incident reports uh, from Blackwater. We have. Mr. Howe was not fully responsive to my statement that we are entitled to receive information even if it is classified. And we, 
want you and expect you to turn over that document to us. Will, will you comply? I, w I want to ensure that we comply with the law, sir, and, and I want to fully uh, respond to the committee as much as possible. I, we, will, we will turn over everything that we are permitted to without um, affecting attorney-client privilege and um, government classification interests. And, and if that's not a sufficient answer, I, I would have to provide one in writing, sir. I, I, well, let, sure let, me, let me suggest this to you in case there's any vagueness of the law. Yes, sir. We will uh, s supply you with the information about uh, how uh, about our entitlement to information, notwithstanding its classification, and um, that should eliminate the objection that you've raised to us. Attorney-client privilege. We will talk further about that, but uh, matters that the Congress are entitled to receive, we expect to receive. Unless you have some argument against it that uh, fits into um, exceptions that are recognized, sir, and we'll both look at that yes, uh, together. Yes, um, if I could just make a comment too, and just a question. Sure. Um, one, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy, uh, frankly, um, for the position of Blackwater right now, but I do have a concern, and I just want to express it. If if information is provided to the committee. Uh, that is important for the committee to know. Is it then transferred to uh, the parties that are in a lawsuit, and then does it become available to to the to uh, either side? A and is that a role we should be playing? And no, I absolutely not. It's not a role we should be playing, and would not be transferred to uh, for purposes of litigation, especially if it's classified okay. information. Well, and and then just if I could um, make a closing comment about uh, this hearing, I just think it really has uh, set the stage, I think, for a, a, a very real uh, dialogue about a lot of things. For instance, I just didn't know the disinterest of one contractor, of the government contracting out and then subcontractors. And, and the further down the chain you get, it, there doesn't seem to be this interest either by the original contractor or by the government, in my judgment. And that concerns me. And I would also like to know, what is the policy of our government? I consider contractors who die in Iraq uh, as much heroes as anyone else who's risked their life in Iraq. Uh, they're contractors. And it just strikes me that the family should have the same courtesies that, that exist for uh, military families. And I, I'm struck by the fact that we may want to get into um, providing advice, counsel, whatever, in the course of our hearing as to a, a uniform practice that should be provided, because I'm left with the impression from our first four witnesses that they were treated in a very shabby way. And, and, um, and I'd like to think no one would be treated like that. That's the impression I'm, I'm left with. So I thank the, my chairman for allowing me to close with those comments. Well, I appreciate your comments. They certainly feel that way. They expressed it with a great deal of emotion and very powerful testimony today. Uh, Mr. Shays, I, I'm pleased that you stayed here for the whole hearing. Uh, you more than any other member of Congress in the last Congress uh, actually act actively got into many of these issues. And we look forward to working with you and Mr. Davis on a bipartisan basis. These are not partisan issues. I resent, I resent it uh, when people try to make this into a partisan issue. Um, and I particularly resent it when it suggests that the family members came before us as partisans. Um, it's such an outrage. They're the ones who lost people in Iraq, and we have no idea what their party affiliation, nor do we have any interest in knowing what their party affiliation is. Uh, to this panel, I thank you very much. We will uh, have uh, Chairman, uh, possible excuse questions. Excuse me, Chairman Waxman. Yes, uh, we will uh, have possible questions for the record, and we'd ask you to respond. Yes, Mr. Murray. Yes, I, I do. I would like to just make, <clears throat> if I may, one clarification mm -hmm. on uh, comments that were discussed in the earlier session. Uh, there were discussions around our our contract, ESS's contract with Regency, which is dated the 8th of March, and a subsequent meeting to that on the 11th of March, whereby ESS and Regency and Blackwater attended a, a joint uh, implementation meeting. I just wanted to advise the committee that our contract dated the 8th of March did not change. None of the terms or none of the conditions of that contract changed as a result of that meeting or any other 
reason. The contract on the 8th of March stood as it is. Okay, we appreciate that clarification. All right. Thank, Thank you. you all. You've been uh, very helpful to us, and we appreciate your being here and giving of your time and your answers to us. That uh, concludes our hearing. We stand adjourned. A group of U.S. Army soldiers were charged Monday by the Justice Department with taking bribes from government contractors. That news briefing snacks. Then in case you missed it earlier, the testimony of families of private security guards who were killed in Iraq. That's in about 35 minutes. Thursday on the C-SPAN networks, on Washington Journal, your phone calls for members of Congress on Iraq.